Hello everyone, it's time for MerPay Tech Fest 2022. I am Sen Sui, VP of Engineering at MerPay. So I'll be doing the moderator for opening and closing sessions today. So MerPay Tech Fest 2022, this is the final day. Thank you for being with us. Uh, this is an online event and there may be some problems and mishap, but please uh, kindly understand. MerPay Tech Fest 2022 is a technical conference for software engineers working in IT companies and those interested in the MerPay technology stack. So it has been held online over three days. So we hope this conference will help you to get to know and get interested in MerPay's products and the technology behind our services. So last year was the first time we held a conference, and the updates uh, this year is that we want like to make the conference more interactive. We have Q&A time after the talk session, so please feel free to ask questions. And also, the panel discussion will be held on a real-time basis. So we would like to make a few announcements and requests to all the participants. The first is about language channels. This event will be available in Japanese and English channels. Uh, please select the YouTube uh, Live, uh, which is uh, in your respective languages. You can find that in the YouTube overview section. And the second is about the code of conduct. In order to provide a safe and secure event experience for everyone involved in the event, please do not do anything that is contrary to the purpose of the event or harass others. For more information, please see the event code of conduct in the YouTube overview section. Third. Your comments are welcome at MerPay Tech Fest 2022. And uh, the comments will be received real time. Uh, please uh, submit your comments from the YouTube uh, chat as well as uh, Twitter. The Twitter hashtag is MerPay Tech Fest. So it would be great if you could respond, especially at the beginning and at the end of each session. The speakers and staff will also be on hand at the YouTube chats. So I hope you will participate. So please uh, go ahead and write in comments. The fourth is about questions during the sessions. So we are receiving questions through uh, two channels, the chat section of YouTube and in post with hashtag on Twitter. The question will be answered either during the QA time or through text. 
about uh, next is about the survey. We are collecting questionnaires on a daily basis for this, this event. Please complete the survey once every once per person. If you are only going to watch today, please answer the questionnaire after you finished watching. If you are going to watch, uh, if you have watched uh, on day one and day two, please also uh, fill in the survey for the respective dates. So now I will explain about today's session. On day three, we have prepared six sessions under the topic Fundamental Technologies and Organizations. The first session is Creating a Unified Microservice Experience on Top of Kubernetes by SRE Team. And they will introduce the Merpay case study and discuss the benefits of these efforts for both microservice developers and SREs. And this will be delivered by Tsuchi-san and Jun-san. And the second session is History of Cloud, Spanner, and Merpe by the Solution uh, Team by Symmetal and AppStim. The session will be a panel discussion. Merpe uses Cloud Spanner as its main database. Merpe was released in 2019, so it has been about three years, including the development period we have been using Cloud Spanner for more than four years. During that time, Cloud Spanner was, has released many features and our operations have changed accordingly. This session will look back at how Cloud Spanner and Merpay have worked in tandem. The session will be uh, by Masatomo Takano from QA team on the launch of the QA automation. The Merpay QA team is constantly going through a trial and error process for quality assurance activities in order to deliver better services to customers as quickly as possible. Recently, test automation has become indispensable for speedy service delivery. Merpay is also promoting test automation company-wide, but it cannot be said that all teams are yet fully utilizing automated testing. We therefore decided to set up a dedicated automation team within QA to promote test automation. We have organized the difficulties we faced in setting up the team and the current status of test automation and will present the results of these efforts. The fourth session is a microservice dashboard introduction and deep dive by Yuta Uexa from the engineering productivity team. At Merpe, many microservices are operated under the ownership of developers. While many microservices are being operated, it has become difficult to understand the quality of each service and the teams that manage it. To solve this problem, a microservice dashboard has been developed to collect and view all microservice information in one place. In this session, uh, they will introduce the mechanism of data collection with screenshots of the microservice dashboard and how the collected data is not only displayed, but also provided as an API for secondary use. The fifth session is a practical team on payment and infrastructure by Liu-san, payment platform team. The payment platform has been built to support the businesses of the Mercury Group since the release of MailPay. In this session, uh, we will introduce the structure of the payment infrastructure, each domain component, and the challenges from technical perspective. The session will also introduce the challenges they are currently facing and the direction they are taking in the future as they are constantly evolving to become the plat product platform of choice of product teams. The final session will be Building an Inclusive Multicultural Environment at Merpay, Past, Present, and Future by Robert and Tim. This session will be a panel discussion. Merpay attracts the best and brightest from over 40 countries. While diversity brings many benefits, excuse me, uh, while diversity brings many benefits, it also presents its own challenges, such as language barriers and cultural differences. In order to make Merpay a company where everyone can find their Place, we have conducted a number of projects, workshops, and added processes over the past few years. Examples include gentle communication and unconscious bias training, and most recently, the inclusive team initiative is underway. Robert and Tim will share their experiences at Merpay and discuss the various approaches. So we hope you find the sessions useful. The next session, uh, we will be starting the session shortly. The next session will start at 10 past 1. Please wait a few moments before the start. 
So let's see you again at the closing. I will now give a presentation titled Creating a Unified Microservices Operational Experience on Top of Kubernetes. Thank you. Firstly, self-introduction. I am T. Kuchiki from Melpay SRE team. I am working on a cloud spanner, maintaining OSS called Spanner Autoscaler, and I enjoy writing tools in Go and implement log analysis tools called ALP for fun. Here's the agenda for this session. First, I will explain about Malpay's microservice operations, including the operational challenges of microservices, the scale of the services, the foundation of microservices, and the role of Malpay SRE. Next, I will introduce two examples of how the Melpay SRE team, which operates the infrastructure common to microservices, has worked to improve the operational experience by providing a configuration as data-like mechanism for operations as well. And finally, some of the benefits of unifying the operational structure on Kubernetes will be explained. To begin, I will discuss Merpay's microservice operations. First, let me talk about the challenges in operating microservices. In order to create a scalable organization, each day team takes ownership from a development to operation of microservices. However, if the operation is left to each team and a disparate system is created, there will be issues like tool development cost will increase, common operating rules cannot be applied, and SRE is not able to follow up. Therefore, we have built a platform to operate each microservice, and by operating on this platform, we eliminate the need to create mechanism for each microservice and apply common operating rules. Merpay's services run on a microservices platform with over 60 microservices and over 1,000 Kubernetes parts. Merpay's microservices run on a platform built and operated by Merokari's microservices platform team. On this platform, developers take ownership to build and operate the services. Therefore, we have mechanism in place to practice infrastructure code with Terraform to manage GCP resources and to put configuration as data into practice by managing resources on Kubernetes with YAML. Terraform and Kubernetes resources do GitOps, so 
When a pull request is merged into GitHub, it is applied. Dep deployment to Kubernetes is done using Spinnaker. In the previous slide, the words IAC and CAD were mentioned. IAC as infrastructure as code may be familiar to many of you, but CAD as configuration as data does not seem to be so widespread yet. So I will mention this briefly here. Configuration as data is the concept of managing infrastructure as data that declares the state it should be in. Taking Kubernetes doing CAD as an example, Kubernetes users manage resources such as deployment by writing them in YAML. But it is the Kubernetes controller that actually creates the resources. This approach is to clearly separate the data and the layer that handles the data. There is also a config connector to manage GCP resources like Kubernetes resources. If Mericarage Microservices Platform team is responsible for operating the microservices platform, what is the role of the Merpe SRE team? This includes promoting SLA operations, supporting operations on microservices platform, and operating a common microservice infrastructure. The Merpe SRE team has been working to improve the operational experience of microservice developers as part of its operational support efforts. In this context, we are also incorporating and providing a CAD-like structure for operations. In this session, I will present two case studies of our efforts to improve the operational experience. The first is an example of automating operations by providing Cloud Spanner's auto-scale functionality utilizing a Kubernetes custom controller. Before I get into the case study, let me touch on Cloud Spanner. Cloud Spanner is GCP's fully managed relational database. Nodes can be increased or decreased without downtime and can be easily scaled. Meripay uses it as a standard database for microservices. When, cloud, uh, when operating Cloud Spanner, there are often cases where you want to increase or decrease the node number of nodes. Since Merpe uses Terraform to manage Cloud Spanner, if the number of nodes needs to be changed, the developer creates a pull request and executes a Terraform, a Terraform apply via CI. We will have no problems when resources are in excess and the number of nodes needs to be reduced. But when the load increases due to increased traffic and the number of nodes needs to be increased, the speed required to complete the response becomes an issue. A developer creates a pull request, waits for CI to complete, review it, merge the pull request, and waits for CI to complete executing Terraform apply, which will take at least 10 minutes. Therefore, we felt it was necessary to scale up automatically when CPU usage reached a certain threshold. To achieve auto scaling, we first considered how to implement a combination of GCP products. Periodically running the process of increasing the number of nodes when a specific threshold is reached by operating CPU utilizing metrics can be 
accomplished by utilizing cloud scheduler, cloud functions, and cloud monitoring. When combining GCP products to achieve auto scaling, there are two possible methods of operation. The first is to run in run it in on each microservice. MailPay creates a GCP project for each microservice and runs Cloud Spanner in that GCP project. Given the ownership of microservices, it seems natural to let our own GCP project perform the auto-scaling auto process. The second method is to run the auto-scaling process in one GCP project and manage Cloud Spanner for multiple GCP projects. In this case, each microservice is not operated by its own developer, but by a centralized SRE. Thus, it appears that a combination of GCP products could perform the auto-scaling process. However, there were concerns with each of the two methods. First, when operating in each microservice, there are more things for developers to operate. The auto-scale function is necessary for operating microservices, but developers should be able to concentrate, concentrate on product development. Then, if we choose to operate centrally so that developers can focus on developing the product, the burden on SRE increases. It also undermines developer ownership if SRE reviews is SRE review is required every time auto scale settings are added or changed. The combination of GCP products did not seem optimal, so we considered other methods. Therefore, we turned to Kubernetes. If the resources can be managed as Kubernetes resources, such as deployment or config map, we can include auto-scaling in the existing operational flow, such as reviewing and deploying resources within the microservice team. To manage auto-scale settings as a Kubernetes resource, Kubernetes custom controller must be implemented. Kubernetes customer controllers perform processing on user-defined resources or custom resources. A mechanism called a reconciliation loop compares the declared state with the actual state and keeps them in sync with the state it should be in. This diagram is from the book Managing Kubernetes. It shows a sequence of steps, getting the current status of the resource and changing the current state to match the state declared by the user. Let me apply the reconciliation loop process to Cloud Spanner's auto-scaling process. It is the very process of auto-scaling when you think of it as taking the current number of nodes and continuously changing it to the number of nodes declared by the user. And I realize that this is similar to the horizontal pod auto-scaler, which is familiar to anyone running Kubernetes. Conf uh, confident that we were we were headed in the right direction, we implemented a Kubernetes custom controller that would monitor and scale Cloud Spanner while functioning like an HPA. We then released it as OSS under the name Spanner Autoscaler in June 2020. 
In addition, we released a scheduled scaling function in April 2022, which will allow us to temporarily increase the number of nodes on a set schedule. This picture shows the operation of a microservice utilizing Spanner Autoscaler. The SRE only manages Spanner Autoscaler, so the burden does not increase even if the number of microservices increases. Developers only need to create custom Spanner Autoscaler resources, and ownership is not compromised as the work is completed within the team. Now for the summary of the first case study. After running Cloud Spanner for a while, we found that there was an issue with the operational flow of increasing and decreasing the number of nodes. Since an autoscaling function was necessary to solve this issue, we showed you the implement so we showed the implementation methods we considered and talked about how we actually chose to go about it. Now with Spanner Autoscaler in place, developers can take ownership and manage autoscale settings. If you are familiar with Cloud Spanner, you may have wondered why we are not using it when Google's official autoscaler is available. Therefore, we will briefly mention the official autoscaler, which autoscales Cloud Spanner using a combination of GCP products and was released around September 2020. Spanner Autoscaler only uses CPU task priorities as a scaling metric. The official autoscaler, on the other hand, can scale not only with that, but also with a 24-hour moving average of CPU usage and storage utilization. This is the architecture diagram. I will not go into a detailed explanation of what each component does, but if you want to combine GCP products and autoscale cloud spanner, this is a good way to do it. However, Melpay did not adopt the official autoscaler. The reason is that the issues we raised when we considered implementing an autoscaler in combination with GCP products were likely to occur as well. And we decided that the operational experience would be better if we could manage the autoscale settings as a current Kubernetes resource. Let's now move on to the second case study. This is about improving the operation of Cloud Spanner backups using SRE managed container images. Before we get into the main case study, I would first like to mention Cloud Spanner backups. Cloud Spanner has two backup methods known as backup and export, respectively. Backups have no performance impact as backups are performed using dedicated jobs that do not utilize the instance server resources. However, as the backup data is tied to the instance, it cannot be moved and can only be stored for a maximum of one year. Export, on the other hand, is queried as a priority task and may have some performance impact. However, the data can be stored on any storage and can be kept until it is deleted. Merpay has chosen export due to disaster recovery and data retention time requirements. 
Cloud Spanner does not have the ability to perform these two backups automatically and regularly. Therefore, they need to be operated from the web console or by executing the API. Sending regular API requests can be achieved by using Cloud Scheduler, so automatic backups are possible in combination with Cloud Scheduler. Thus, it is possible to acquire backups using Cloud Scheduler alone, but there were requirements for Slack notifications in the event of export job failure and for measuring the execution time of export jobs, so implementation of a tool was considered. The options for implementing tools included App Engine's Kuron service, a combination of Cloud Scheduler and Cloud Functions, or a combination of Cloud Scheduler and Cloud Run, etc. As several members had a lot of App Engine experience, the Curon service of App Engine was adopted. After running Cloud Spanners, automated backups in App Engine for some time, a problem arose. Developers did not have the authority to operate App Engine, so SRE had to do the setup. Also, when we wanted to update the configuration, we had to make a request to SRE. And as the number of microservices increased, the burden of SRE increased. This is why we started working on improving the backup acquisition operation. From the point of view of making it possible for developers to manage backups alone, Building a deployment pipeline via CI could solve the problem. However, as the app engine is only used to acquire backups, the deployment pipeline is also dedicated to this. Even though there was no other option, the cost of what we wanted to do seemed very high. Also, if the application configuration is managed in Kubernetes YAML and the backup configuration is managed elsewhere, there is a concern that the number of things to manage will increase and the operational effort will increase. That's why we looked at existing mechanisms. Deployments to Kubernetes are done in Spinnaker and there is a mechanism on the platform to create Spinnaker's deployment pipeline in YAML. Therefore, by using Kubernetes itself, including the execution of export jobs, it is possible to define the deployment pipeline consistently in YAML from building and deployment pipeline to setting up backups. In addition, since deployment and other aspects of Kubernetes are also managed in YAML, they can be managed in the same way as applications, providing an operational experience similar to that of microservices. With the policy in place, we set about improving. In order to run what was previously running in App Engine with Kubernetes Kuron job, we needed container images. When we first deployed it in several microservices, we tried the method of creating an image for each microservice. This method was natural given the microservice principle but it was time consuming to create a backup specific Docker file and build the images. It also seemed wasteful to host it in each microservice, even though the content of the image is the same. For this reason, we decided to use an image created by SRE for use by each microservice.
The diagram below shows a backup operation using SRE managed container images. The, S the SRE only manages the container images, so the burden does not increase as the number of microservices increase. Developers only need to create YAML, and ownership is not compromised as the work is completed within the team. Here is the summary of the second case study. Mirpay's cloud spanner backup acquisition operations were not being operated with dev developer ownership, and there was high load on SRE. Therefore, we introduced a case study where the environment was prepared so that developers could configure the backup settings themselves, reducing the load on the SRE without compromising the developer's ownership. Lastly, I will discuss the benefits of unifying the operation mechanism with Kubernetes, for Kubernetes through two case studies. First, by unifying the operations in a Kubernetes environment, they can all be expressed in YAML. This makes it easier for developers to work with YAML as they only need to manage the YAML. Also, even if there are more things to manage, the base configuration is in YAML, so there is less to catch up on for each tool, and this reduces the operational burden. Above all, the configuration is completed within the team, so there is no loss of ownership. The Merpay SRE team focuses on this when designing as the operational structure. This is because when operating a large number of microservices, having an environment where each team can operate with ownership is essential for creating a scalable organization. It also has the advantage for SREs that they can reduce the number of tools and focus on other engineering tasks. Here is the summary. We introduced two case studies where the CAD mechanism was incorporated into operations to improve the operational experience. Through the introduction of case studies, we showed how unifying the operational mechanism with Kubernetes provides an operation experience that is easy enough to write and deploy YAML without compromising the developer's ownership. We hope this presentation was helpful for your operations. Thank you for your kind attention. Hello, everyone. We would like to start the QA session for this presentation. I'm T. Jun, in charge of MC of this QA. I joined the same team as him, and I'm a manager. So taking this opportunity, we would like to take questions from the floor audience. And we are still accepting your questions. So please post your questions on Twitter as well as YouTube comment. And please use Mailbatic first hashtag when you post questions on Twitter. So with this, we'd like to start QA session. So thank you very much, Mr. Kuchiki, for your presentation. So let's move on to the first question. In your presentation, you talked about infrastructure as code as well as configuration as data. So what is the difference between these two? Could you tell me about that? Yes. It's so long, so I would like to abbreviate it to IAC and CAD. So 
both of them would describe the state that the raw resource should be. In that sense, they are common. However, e ISC is to write a code to make the state of the infrastructure as it is. And whenever changes are made, they are the tools are executed and applied. However, in the case of CAD, they we write down the settings that are defined based on the de defined state. And in order to make that state with reconciliation loop, the operation is continuously applied and executed. Taking the example of IAC of Terraform, at emergency, if you set, uh, change the settings without uh, Terraform at emergency, then the change would not be reflected to Terraform code. So that means there is a gap between the actual state and code. However, in the case of CAD, there is always a continuous settings applied through reconciliation loop. Therefore, although it, it is not possible to uh, ask a direct changes for the state, uh, for the settings at emergency, the, there will be no gap between the defined settings and actual state. And CAD will not replace IAC, but rather it's a concept that can coexist. For example, you make up a GKE and utilizing config connector, you can realize CAD. And in order to do that, first you need to uh, make a GKE, P VPC, and network. So as it as you see, the infrastructure orchestration is always required for that purpose. So it depends on the cases. So each of ships should be used. It depending on the cases. Thank you. Thank you. That means if it's CADE, depending on the reconcile, uh, the uh, stages uh, will be modified uh, accordingly. Thank you. Next question. In addition to the case studies presented in the session, are there any other initiatives you are considering in the future? You talked about Spanner, Autoscaler, and Backup in your presentation. Other than this, are there any other initiatives you are working on? First, uh, before talking about the future, I would like to tell you about what we are already working on. The Mercari's microservice platform team is uh, developing a Kubernetes kit, which is uh, written in the language called CUE. Uh, the Spanner autoscaler deployment and the configuration of Cloud Spanner backup can now be done in the Kubernetes kit. So because of that, Merpe side team, we are support migrating service that used to write Kubernetes YAML directly to use Kubernetes kit, as well as deployments using Kubernetes Kip. And future initiatives include the design and development of Terraform module called Spanner Kit. Kubernetes related configuration or setup can now be easily done with the Kubernetes Kit, but setting up IAM for the service account used by Spanner Autoscaler and Cloud Spanner backups and setting up the workload identity settings are done in Terraform. And currently, various Terraform resources are written for each microservice. And uh, the Spanner kit is a module to simplify the writing of this Terraform and make it easier to implement. And about the Spanner kit, we may have some opportunity to talk about in the future. That's all. Thank you very much. So abstraction is required. Then developers do not have to pay a kind of meticulous attention. OK, thank you very much. So let me move on to the next question. So, in order for developers to write Terraform and YAML, what type of quiz, uh, trainings are conducted? So, for SRB members, they usually can understand Terraform and Kubernetes. But rather than that, so microservice developers, maybe if they have, are going to write down with YAML, 
So what type of re uh, training trainings are required or any ideas to enhance that skill? Well, if you are starting from scratch, then as for Terraform and Kubernetes, there is a rich public document available, so I think you can refer to them. And if you have a basic understanding about the writing, then we already have some Kubernetes as well as uh, Terraform resources, so that uh, you can refer to them as well. And they're not about developers, but it's about us. It's about our team at the onboarding. The, we ask them to write down the Terraform code as well as Kubernetes manifest so that these services would be deployed for practice. That's what we are doing as well. And this is not the case of our team, but there is a team that is creating a Terraform cheat sheet. So in order to enable cloud, uh, cloud spanner, uh, you need instance, database, and the service account. So you need to uh, apply IAM to instance, database, and service account. So there will be some samples to write down that Terraform code, as well as what would be re uh, required to be paid attention when you actually write down. So that type of document is available. So as a microservice onboarding, if you prepare some common resources, that will be very beneficial when you launch microservice. That's my impression. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, do you, so it's not, there's no special training or program for that, but each team is using their ingenu uh, ingenuity and they are referencing existing code. Okay, thank you. Okay, up to here, uh, we have gone through all the questions I had. If there is anyone who has additional questions, we are still receiving uh, questions on YouTube or Twitter. We still have a little bit more time, but if there are no more questions, I have one question. The spanner, autoscaler, and is so what kind of hardships did you go through in uh, writing this? I'm not the in original author, but uh, it was uh, very difficult to do the catch up because it was the first time for me to write this uh, Kubernetes and the reconcile mechanism. You need to understand the reconcile mechanism. Uh, you won't be, you won't know how to write it. So we need to go through lots of trials and errors and act by actually writing the code. But uh, talking about spanners, GCP and clouds has offers various APIs. And if you can call these APIs well, that can do the job. So that part uh, was very helpful. So as long as you know how to write the Kubernetes controller, to some extent, uh, the mechanism is not that difficult. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, now we, ah, okay, so we would like to end. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, please fill in uh, the survey. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hello. Hello, everyone. It's just now finally started. So the ups, ups that now and I will talk about the uh, cloud spanner and the steps that the mail they took. So this is a panel discussion session on live. So if you have any question, please feel free to post the question uh, on a YouTube chat or the Twitter hashtag, hashtag MailBayTechFest. We will pick up the question as it comes. So let me uh, introduce myself. I'm called Simero. I belong to a solution team. I was looking over the GAE in the past, but currently I started to use in the cloud run. I used to use the um, data store, but now I'm using the spanner as well. So nice to meet you. Okay, Abuston Neville. So I also belong to the solution team. I joined the Melgali two years ago, and then I was looking over the whole GCP, but then like uh, execution plan on the cloud library implementations around the uh, cloud spanners uh, are my responsibility. Okay, let's get started. Well, I feel like it's almost, uh, you know, getting to the end, but then, uh, you know, I do like to um, talk about the topic one by one. So this is the really release history of ML Bay and Spana. So I do like to look back the past a little bit. So Spana, uh, uh, had a GA in 2017. I think it was about a January or February time frame. And around the summer in Tokyo, like uh, either the next to a summit event by Google was held and oh. then the Tokyo region uh, came out in that event. So Melpay was probably it launched in February 2019, but it, the development started in 2018. So it was less than uh, one year uh, than the launch of the spanner that uh, Melpe started to use the spanner for the development. Like, yes, actually, uh, immediately after the GA, then we started to use the spanner before even having a, a DNA. Yes, we discussed what we, we should do with the DBE, but then like, uh, uh, you know, uh, the CTO uh, said, back then said that uh, we should choose a spanner. So then we decided on a spanner. So I was using the cloud data store. So fortunately, I was working in Sozo, under the Mercari group and which creates the Mercari shop, but up and the cow were being developed and the up aging was used. So uh, there were quite a few members who were using the cloud data store. And so those people actually moved to MailPay. So, so we were used to the uh, Google style DB. So, so we were pretty comfortable with that. Yes, it's a cloud uh, horizontally distributed cloud database. So uh, you have a lot in common, right? Yes. So looking at the history, after launch, there were some additional functionalities to the cloud spanner. So, but uh, what, uh, and then how did it, you proceed. Yes. Um, time to uh, some time to time. Actually, SLA one node or the CP priority and 
clavier instance sizing, granular instance sizing, those things actually impacted our decision because for each microservices, shall we set up the spanner or shall we include the um, multiple microservices in a single spanner? So we have to think about that based on these. So SLA one node, so unless it is released, unless it was released, the uh, you know SLA was not provided to the single instance. And like a production instance was defined above the three nodes. So then for that, the 99.9% SLA were, was provided. But then for the small instance, SLA was not provided. So for the production use, you have to have the, uh, we have to coexist in the uh, three, above three nodes uh, instances. So what, what we did at Melpay, but now, so we have a one microservices in one instance now, right? For the de development environment, So about a, uh, about eight thousand yen is enough. So for uh, if you set up the one microservices uh, or one uh, instance for in the development environment, it's okay. Yes, you may not need the SLA for a development in environment, but then if we coexist, then that the, there are some problems. Yes. Vision san or Kuchiki san teams, SRE team created the uh, shared spanner instance. So we were all in there, but it's for the development purpose. So we have some authority so we can uh, delete the instance. Therefore, some people made a mistakes to delete the instance. And so a uh, whole whole uh, like a condominium just disappeared. Right, the, for one, one team have the one instance for, for a development environment now. So that problem is solved now, right? Yes, uh, you know, we have more choices now. And also around, after the launch, we kept feeding back to the Google or requesting the uh, functionality like a point time recovery or backup related recoveries. We've been requesting. Yes, uh, we we repeatedly requested those. Yeah, before that, what did we do? Export. We we did an export like a back, not the backup restore for the data store, but uh, we exported. And we exported the spanner as well, just like we did with the uh, data store. So backup export was uh, stored on a Google Cloud storage and sometimes uh, stored in a multi regions, yes. Therefore internally when we say backup, it means it meant export. So uh, it's confusing. It was confusing, right? Yes. So what's the definition of backup? Like that was a question, right? We may not restore. We sometimes archived. So uh, it's confusing. It was confusing. It was, yes. Right. For a BI, for the BI, like uh, we put the, something on a big query. And so uh, then that the multiple things extracted the data from the spanner. Yes, point in time recovery is now available. And so for the uh, latest one hour, you can go to the time travel, you can do the time travel or you can extract the data. But for and now that the Google extended to uh, seven days, so multi-version concurrency control. 
so uh, the multi versions are stored in a storage and the, it the perpetual store is a waste of uh, resources but um, the they uh, extended the storage period to uh, seven days by that like they realized the point of point in time recovery and also in point of recovery queries are also available and also because there it is queries available export flow snapshot time is also can be defined so it was a kind of convenient feature yeah right you can take it daily so 0, 0.000 time that's the processing time if you define it or set it up that's going to be the data at that timing so that would be useful yeah when we used to export so there are is a timestamp timestamp did not match among the multiple database so but we just ignored but since we can specify snapshot time from this feature so in within PITR so that we can specify snapshot time so timestamp would be very is getting convenient yeah we have many dbs so each of them if we try to back up for each so if the timing is dispersed when we try to restore as microservice in general the data consistency will be very damaged however so in the end that ends up in the spanner function so in a sense that would be good yeah we can have a uh, common stamp a uh, time stamp thanks to this so that's a good yeah this can be always a cap gap right cloud spanner instance on the side of google side there is a watch and gke gke instances so there is also a watch however there are two those two watches sometimes have back uh, gap, and that was also sometimes cause problems. Yeah, maintenance sometimes is stopped, and I think especially that in that timing there can be often some gaps generated as for timing. So I really understood and felt that the computing time is not always in sync. So spanner is uh, very trustworthy. So we always basically try on the quality of database yeah every it was a good opportunity to consider what is time what is the current timing or the clock yeah everybody trusts the, your watch but if it's not always true even when you trust it and cpu priority so this is also a kind of convenient tool so it's of course it is not perfect that does not solve everything but so for example you cannot create read replica but by defining a cpu priority to some extent you can lower the priority for some so it was a kind of a nice function yeah so some are lady sensitive so the request that microservices request so the query should not be bothered as for such kind of services but they would like to run some backup support so the execution from cloud data flow has uh, is running with lower priority that was the original point we don't know the reason why but it was true and as for the batches written by go so they have the same priority uh, with the common microservices then that would disturb, disturb microservices execution therefore we made a request for some days and it was executed in this state which was very happy for us so they are visible so i really wanted to use this although we were it was not allowed so google that was only google specific that's right so we were expecting that we can also use this function so and this one spanner emulator this is also a convenient one so if at the time we did not have this spanner emulator we are searching for many other ways 
So it's uh, not an open source software spanner. So we definitely need cloud in order to check the behavior. So in that timing, so granular instance signing was not available. So it's very hard to make up some instances. So the environment, the secure environment that we can check the behavior is very important. And we had an in-house emulator and it has higher compatibility, but they made up this emulator and it is highly compatible, so it is convenient. Right, from the global point of view, so this made all of the people to easy to all the people to make uh, feel easy to use spanner other as a, as for for example other vendors and users yeah but one weak point is the, there is a little additional function enhanced through the cloud spanner service, there is always a time lag as for the addition of that feature to spanner emulator. Yeah, this graph shows a large scale type of changes. However, there are some uh, minute changes such as, as for uh, TTL function and so on. There are many other uh, detailed things. So emulator is not catching up with such changes. Yeah. They share the same big uh, front end with big query. So some SQL sentences often have new ones, new versions, but it will usually take some time until it is implemented. So on the production environment, we cannot use it. That often happens. Yeah, it's a kind of headache for us. So in order for them to have an, a simultaneous release, so it's very strange that it should be uh, implemented in an emulator. That uh, then uh, you should it should be em uh, uh, implemented in um, the production. That's strange. So we have to accept it. Yeah, but we at least would like to know at what timing it would be implemented in an emulator. And uh, recently we had change stream, right? That's also the function that we really wanted to have long time ago, since long time ago. So on the side of the cloud spanner, at transaction, when there are some uh, changes made in transaction, then through API, so each of the change will be tried. But in actual usage, cloud data flow or patch B, B SDK is used so that it would be acquired. And also furthermore, public cloud data flow template is used and GCS and BigQuery would be applied. That's also publicly available. And there are many other ways to use that's so we are seeking for the ways to utilize this further within the, in our team. As for the data structure, so, you know, handling stream data itself is also already difficult. So this might require some effort. So if you, to, you, you are to use through data flow template, then you just give par parameters, that is, but in each partition, it should be gained as a per stream. And also that is divided in that they are always divided real time. So it's very hard to use by yourself. So when you use data flow flow, but you need to learn about batch beam. So at, right now you have to start using from Java. So the ordinary microservice developers, for them this might be very hard to use. That's right. Looking at the real kind of cases, they're too real. And if I can cover all of these, then I'll be a master of spanner. So in that sense, it uh, looks very difficult. Yeah, looking at the contents, so how the transaction is processed, that type of procedure, if you can read through, from this context, context, that would be also interesting. So there are some transactions across various types of transactions, so that would be also interesting. Yeah, if you are an expert, you can be in a spanner SRE. That's true. 
So there are many functions and features released. Oh, we also released and launched various functions and features during this timing. And if some features are added to Spanner, they get convenient. And we can sometimes change the way we have been doing. We did, right? Yes. Some of the functions and features have, have been already deployed. CPU priority, that's one thing. CPU priority, that's one thing we need to deploy first. Another thing is that, uh, you know, that was a subside of the uh, Spanner's release history. And so another one which went through a lot was the client client library client library. That's uh, in that's a vivid memory in 2019. We had the days of fighting against the spanner and the Kazigo system in marketing. Uh, you know, wrote a blog talking about what he did. Yeah, there were a lot. Yes. As a Google, so they launched a new services and which was a client library. So it's not much, it wasn't matured. And also Google was using the Go. And, but uh, there were not so many people using the Spanner in Google, even in Google. Right, the Google Cloud Go as concern, you know, in terms of its position, is that just a part of Pana, a Spana, or that is that just a sample implementation? So uh, that, which, that wasn't very clear when I was communicating with the Google. In other companies, like they don't use a Google Cloud Go or client library, and uh, they, they did all from scratch by themselves. But uh, that, uh, you know, but you know, it would it would be too cumbersome. So that's why that we wanted to use this. And so I talked to uh, Google that to improve the quality. So now uh, the not only the Google Cloud Go but the Cloud Spanner client library dedicated engineers exist in uh, Google, so uh, it's it got better. So if I uh, send a pro request, uh, if the pro request was sent, then like uh, you know uh, the whole company got excited. Yes, I had to depend on those people. Yes, if we raised the issue that uh, dedicated engineer responded to it right away, very friendly. Like uh, pro request or issues are uh, raised when, uh, you know, the, they were merged and then, you know, and the functionality would be added and so it would be uh, convenient. So uh, I had that, but Right, and uh, Google didn't uh, re receive the uh, GitHub to receive the pro request. Yeah, we had to use the change request in another format in an official way in order to in order for them to accept the pro request. And uh, Google Cloud Go, Google Cloud Go Spanner package dedicated person didn't exist either. So uh, our request uh, just uh, left alone in the past. Right, the people who are developing uh, libraries know the Spanner well, but uh, they don't know much about the uh, users of the Spanner. So they were not quite sure why we need a certain functionality. So, right, uh, we had uh, yeah, some you know, we had to communicate with the Google people in order to discuss and explain why we we need certain uh, functionality. Yes, like a forking decision was another one. Like when we retried, you know, we had to wait for at least two seconds for retry. And so we felt that the two seconds was too long. So yes, and why we suggested, why don't you fork it and then rewrite it? Why we, we talked about like, we could just fork it and then uh, rewrite it, but right. 
the session pool was changed. Back then, the session in the session pool, I mean, the keep a live process to uh, extend the lifetime uh, didn't exist. So was, you know, we had to confirm that whether the session is was alive or not, and if it's it was dead, like we had to get rid of it. So when we sent a query, you know, we uh, sometimes got the uh, not a live session. And then every time we did try that we had to wait the two seconds. So the session pool was so unstable because of that. So therefore setting up the session pool was uh, not very usable. So, so we had to go for the uh, very conservative setting because of that issue. Like on the Google side, like they said, like uh, you just have to retry, right? And you'll be successful eventually, right? So that was their uh, theory. And but then, like if for our side, if we retry, then it would take too long time. And so that was a discussion point. Yeah. Even if we would be successful in the end, but then if our request had to wait for two seconds, it's a very bad experience for the customers, right? Two seconds is too long, we felt. Yes, but uh, that was changed because of our dis discussion with the Google version 1.1. 1 .1, uh, from the version 1.1, 1 .1, the session pool was changed significantly. So the issue that we had was solved, right? In 2019 or the early 2020, yeah, we were kind of a mind, mind sweeper, mind sweeper. And then so we exploded the things a lot. And also the DC side changed a lot. GRPC itself changed this way so that the Spanner client library had had a dif different behavior, therefore, so the latency was increased. So that kind of topic also happened, right? Yeah, the GRPC client library issue and the Google client library basic authentication issues, for example, existed and also Google uh, Cloud Go Spanner Client Library issues also existed. So uh, there were multiple, I mean, uh, multiple layers of issues happened, right? There are many layers of the issues. So for GRPC, Architect, architect Team Kazegusuri-san, uh, GRPC, we call him, and the also the architect team member look looked at them uh, very carefully. So uh, they worked very hard on the GRPCO. But recently, I mean, my impression is that the people who are going to use it going forward can just use a default setting. I mean, they don't have to worry too much about the details, right? It didn't work uh, with the default setting in the past, and, but then uh, we changed the setting, and but now that the performance was changed, and so therefore maybe we could just uh, put back the set, set up to the uh, default. So using the open telemetry or open sensor, open sensors, uh, to, uh, you know, it makes an output and show them that the, how many sessions are being used. So it is, uh, uh, it got much easier to use for if the session pool configuration isn't appropriate, but we can see the session pool status. So we can tell that, uh, okay, this is not enough or that is not enough. And the Google Cloud Go is embedded and then uh, outputs that uh, trace. So uh, therefore this, uh, okay, this, there is uh, when transaction happens and so live transitions isn't enough or the session pool is small or those uh, records can be seen. 
So observability of the cloud, uh, Google Cloud Go was improved, yes. And, uh, and so if we had all from the beginning, uh, it was much easier for us to do. But the back then that the open census wasn't matured or even didn't exist back then. So uh, like originally, Stack driver client library existed, and so we didn't use that. So uh, we didn't use that. So therefore, the open census was a, doc, a data doc exporter uh, implemented so that now that we were able to use that, those metrics. So from open census to open telemetry, that type of migration, I think we should expect that. Okay, the next topic is about, well, it's about a recent issue. So we didn't talk at the beginning, but for the, well, for the past year or two, I think we often talk about query performance tuning topics. I think that uh, seems to be a common topic these days, right? So in other RTBS, I think we check execution plans very details, but as for Cloud Spanner, as for execution plan, we, even when it is not discussed on open venue, but they are, each of them are searching for some ways and looking at the document thoroughly, so this is the operator, how it goes. And internally, there are such and such parameters. That's why it is, goes in this way. However, looking at the execution plant, plant and from the viewer of the cloud console, that nothing is visible. Therefore, in order to review, there is some information required, which we are missing. So on the database side, we are doing something, but that kind of thing would not be available. But actually, Looking at the raw data of execution plan, there is a very meticulous information rather than the other information is available. So, for example, actually, so if you make up a visualization tool too, you can get a very detailed information. And as you can see on the screen, plan visualizer. In a new vision, we see a lot of more information available, which was not available in the previous version. So, but the only way to share is to check, uh, to take a screenshot. However, you have to click it one by one. So it's very hard to review one by one. I think it's very difficult. It's my impression about the usage. So I don't know whether you anybody is using this for review. I have never used it for the purpose of review. I don't either. So we also use another use that was created internally. So in this case, post name. So this is how it goes. So there is a the representation by by text. So Slack, pre-request, top, GitHub issues. If you paste those documents here, I think that will be good. So I am maybe accustomed to checking on this screen. So, so if, of course, this would look better by updating here, but I don't have many opportunities to check here. So it's tree style. But this tree structure might be easier for us to understand, but you, ha you cannot look at the details here. The benefit of this screen is this is originated from remote call and also pipelines across remote calls uh, is output on the right bottom. So this would be not available in other visualizers in my impression. So. There is always uh, good points and bad points for each of the visualizer. So maybe you need to cho choose depending on what you would like to So, But we in fact review on a GitHub, so that's why we need some text-based information. That's right. So if these are, if we can see the URL, and if you see, look at the URL, 
if we can have the common information, that would be convenient, but that type of thing is not available. Yeah, you can download from JSON, and if you send this to support, support can reproduce it, but I don't think there is a public way to, to visualize this in general. Yeah, upload JSON is not available here. So we can download this JSON, and if you put it in the tool, I think that would be... That's, that way we can use it. And by making up this kind of tool, I think there has been an enhancement in understanding about the execution plan. And also the level of the execution level is also need to be absorbed. So there is an optimizer version change. So even if at the time when there were some changes made, that type of information is also absorbed here. Yeah, that's about query optimizer. It's about a history. Currently, I think it's number four. Yeah, that's optimizer version will be the appropriate page we need to go under query optimizer. So spanner, so one above your selection. Yeah. So number four. Yeah, version 4. At the time of release, it was version 1. And uh, autom automatic index selection was implemented. Anyway, so originally, it was updated without our knowledge. And we didn't pay attention to it very well. However, uh, we, when we start reading execution plan, I started to pay attention. And at the time of the version 3, it was silently released. So before release note description, version was upgraded. And also I understand that the query behavior is different. So I cannot talk details, but actually we, I have some, we had some troubles because of that. And it was rewritten, and version 3 release was suspended because of that. I think there was such kind of event before. And it would be inconvenient if it is released, publicized silently. So we need to talk about release policy beforehand. So right now, on the release note, when it was released, it would not go into the default, but there, uh, we need to go through three, 30 days of evaluation. And during the 30-day evaluation, you can do verification or you can set it up as a free version. So during this documentation, so it says default version 4. So version 5, it's under testing. So version 5 is not default, although this is the latest. Excuse me. This is not the latest, although this is under default. So it's not default. So during this period of time, the verification is done so that it should be released or not. So in a sense, this would give me a safety period. So what's been changed in 5? There are some changes in version 5. So we firstly need to read and we just fixed for the timing, for the time being. And why did it go to 5? That I just wanted to talk about why it didn't go to 5, why we didn't make it 5. So if we are interested in why, please ask questions on Twitter or YouTube Live. So I was planning to talk about log and locks and tags, but I'm afraid it's time for us. Thank you very much for your watching. Thank you indeed. Thank you. Goodbye.
So I am Takano, QA engineer, and I will speak about launching the QA automation team and the current state of test automation. So I will first briefly introduce myself. When I was a new graduate, I was in charge of QA for financial systems. After that, I changed jobs once to the gaming industry and experienced development by tinkering with Unity and Cocos 2D for client, client development and Pearl and Ruby for backend development and joined Melpay in December 2019 as a QA engineer again. I have strong interest around automation among QA work. My hobby is app development, and I'm currently creating an English learning app for people who are not good at English, as I myself is not very good at English myself. Today, I would like to talk about the area around test automation. So I will talk about the challenges faced by the QA team, how the automation team was set up, and what actions were taken. I think many of you may be particularly interested in the current state of test automation at Merpe, so I'd like to give a more in-depth explanation on that part. So let me start by explanation the explaining the challenges. There are a lot of new functions, services, or modifications to be released company-wide, and every team wants to release as soon as possible. Under such circumstances, the Merpe QA organization is slightly short of QA engineers. As a matter of fact, one QA engineer is working on several projects at the same time, and certain projects are being carried out by partner companies, so the Merpe QA team alone has more than it can handle. Therefore, we would like to release the product quality by automating some of the tests while alleviating the shortage of staff as much as possible. However, there is also the problem of not having enough time to even automate the tests. Next, I would like to talk about the establishment of the automation team. While the QA team had some automation challenges, the team I was uh, responsible for was relatively well automated with a lot of help from the development engineers. So here are some past articles, so please read them if you like. These articles are about automated API testing and automated job testing. By automating like this, the release speed of the microservices I was in charge of was stable. Also, as my personal motivation was around automation, I wanted to establish a QA team that can work across teams. So I discussed my aspiration with my manager at the time, and he readily agreed. So I started thinking about how to specifically create an automation team and how to move forward. Before taking concrete action, I first envisioned the ideal situation. As far as existing projects were concerned, regression testing is just running automated tests. For new and renewal projects, we th I thought that the ideal state would be a state where the test automation strategy is decided at the test planning stage and where automated tests can be executed before the release. To reach such states, the automation team's mission was to firstly, firstly to set up an automation infrastructure, and secondly, to bring each QA team to a state where they can write and maintain automated tests. But then a problem arose. When the time came to go ahead with automation, there was a lot we didn't know, such as which teams were able to automate and how much testing and how many services there were to support in the first place. Moreover, when we asked these questions within the QA team, none of the QA members had an overall grasp of the situation. This meant that we couldn't even plan which services to support by when and to what extent. So we decided to first try to understand the situation. Thus, our first move was to first understand the current situation, then select the teams to support, and then support automated testing. Next, I would like to present some concrete actions. 
First is how we organize the current situation and what the results were. As a point of reference for the interviews to understand the current situation, we first tried to identify all the target microservices, as we had no idea about the target microservices in the first place. In addition, we organized the test target units by category, backend, frontend, and application. We also interviewed the teams about the current automation status, the tools they use for testing, and whether they would like to automate in the future. Please bear in mind that these survey results are from last year and are a little out of date. Here is some additional information on the test subjects. There is a reason why we categorize them as backend, front end, and application. This is because the backend is almost equal to the microservices, and many teams at Merpay perform quality assurance on a microservice basis. The reason for this is to find defects that should be found before merging with the front end and app, as well as to find defects that should be found when merging microservices. If quality assurance can be done for each microservice, it is also possible to release microservice on a per microservices basis. For this reason, the scope of quality assurance is categorized as backend, front end, and application. This concept is similar to the commonly known test pyramid. If you are familiar with the test pyramid, it is as if quality assurance is partially implemented at the stage before UI testing. Returning to the current situation, here is the result of identifying the number of services to be covered. The unit of measure is the QA team, which may not be intuitive, but the back end is equal to the number of microservices, and the front end is the number of web based services related to merchants, etc., and for apps, the number of microservices used from the apps. In Merpay, there are overwhelmingly more microservices, and a higher proportion of QA is also targeted at the back end. This is the result of the automation status. For the back end, 35.4 of the services are being tested manually. 30.8% have completed automation to the extent possible, 26.2% do not require automation, and 70.7% are partially automated but still have areas that can be automated. For the front end, 72.7% .7 of services have automation, 18.2% have manual, and 9.1% uh, have no need for automation. For apps, 42.9% were done manually, 42.2.9% did not require automation, and 14.3% 40, partially automated. As a trend that emerged from these results, the proportion of services that have already been automated was highest in front end services, followed by back ends and then apps. So as supplementary information, the reasons for not requiring automation include the scale is small and there is little benefit in automation, in-house services where QA is not involved in the first place, services that are no longer in operations or services that have completed their role, and services that cannot be checked without using actual equipment such as NFC. Next is about the tools which were used, and the results are as followed. For the back end, Postman accounted for the majority, 51.2%, followed by uh, an in-house scenario and in-house tool provided by Merpay Architects team, 39%, and the rest were in-house tools implemented by microservices, 9.8%. As for the front end, the situation was almost exclusively Cypress, which accounted for 90% of the total, with some in-house tools being used. For apps, the usage rates of each OS was 100%, but XCUI was used for iOS and Espresso was used for Android. To break down the back end a little more, the back end can be broadly divided into two categories, API testing and job testing, so we also graphed the results by API and job. 
In terms of automation status, 34.4% of APIs are done manually, 29.5% are automated, 27.9% of services do not require automation, and 8.2% are partially automated. The trend for jobs was split between 50% manual, 25% automated, and 25% partially automated. Given that a higher proportion of job tests were executed manually than API tests, there was a trend that testing jobs seems to be more difficult to automate. Looking at the tools used, Postman was used for 61.8% of APIs and Scenarigo for 38.2%, while original in-house tools for each microservice accounted for 66.7% of jobs and Scenarigo for 33.3% with Postman for APIs and in-house tools for jobs accounting for the majority. The trend was also divided here with Scenarigo being used for some of the jobs. Many of the back-end in-house tools were used to execute jobs and one-offs. Therefore, many teams basically check the results by visually checking the DB tables. Therefore, it is rare to find a case where the testing of job can be automated using in-house tools. However, there are cases where job execution and even checking of expected values were carried out, which we have introduced in part uh, past articles. If you are interested, please read through these articles. As an interesting trend, when we surveyed the tools used only for services that perform manual backend testing, we found that Postman was used by 92.9% .9 and in-house tools by 7.1%, with Postman having the, by far the highest rate of use. I believe that this is due to the fact that the postmen are more readily available and therefore more likely to be employed when responding with a sense of urgency. Also, the scenario is not used in manual testing because they are tools uh, to execute test scenarios and are used to on the premise that they can be automated. So here's a summary of a test automation trend. First, let's talk about the backend. In API testing, in the most, most cases, postman or scenario is used. Also, Postman is used for manual execution of API tests in most cases. As for job testing, in-house tools for each microservices or scenario was used. Also, I found that the development engineers also perform integration testing. But for that testing, they use the E2E testing framework, which is made in Go language. From the API test on and onward, the QA team is doing the test, uh, they, and they are using the different tools. You can read more about the E2E test framework used by the development engineers in this article. So if you are interested, please refer to it. Next, I would like to talk about front-end trends. The front-end is basically using Cypress. This is because it is easy to set up and easy to write test codes and well documented. And it is an OSS that is used by many people and for various other reasons. It meets the requirement of what we want to do with MailPay better than other testing tools. For the parts that are difficult to automate in Cypress, we do manual testing. Another thing that is a little bit different from the back end is that the front end side uses Cypress, which is also used in the QA phase during the integration testing phase. Uh, you can read more about the front end team's test automation policy in this article. So uh, if you're interested, please check it out. Next, let's talk about trends in apps. On the upside, the tools are also very clear. iOS is using XCUI and Android is using Espresso. The reason is because on the Mercari side, there is a trend that the development engineers write tests and the development engineers themselves select tools that are easy to use and the Mercari follows the suite. 
Uh, there was a time when QA automated the process using Appium, but there was a problem that the management cost was too high, so we heard that uh, they changed the way. Uh, lastly, I'd like to talk about the overall trend. And for the front end team is running the foremost front in automation. I think that automation trends to increase if the uh, similar environments are used to write test codes by both development and QA engineers. Here are the list. So for front end, both development and the QA engineer use Cypress. Back end, development engineers use Go language and the QA engineer use Postman or Scenario. For apps, only development engineer use XCUI or Espresso. Based on the trend of automation, so far we decided to define an automation policy as an automation team considering how to make automation more valuable. We basically focus on one tool as the selection criteria. We want development engineers to write test codes, so we wanted to select the tool which is easy to use for development engineers. We aim to make it possible for any development and the QA engineer to write the test code, so to make the test code simple with emphasis on main maintainability and the readability. The simple means uh, different for everything, but uh, I have an idea that one element of simplicity is describes the test codes based on the behavior. This is an article by Suemarasan of Otified, and he said that the, what is required for the ET test is that the behavior remains the same and this uh, spec change of behavior should be uh, detected in e 2 testing and therefore behavior is justice. So I agree with this and I think that the unit of a behavior is easy to understand by people which naturally improves readability. To give you a concrete example on the back end, uh, for each uh, meaningful behavior such as uh, creating a user or that's, uh, making a smart payment to buy a product or the executing a monthly job to make it ready for a clearing or the check if the clearing has been completed successfully uh, or not, you write a simple step test code so by doing so test code becomes very easy to understand. As a front end example, uh, please think of a typical web services like entering an address, entering a password, pressing a log button, uh, login button, making sure that the user is transferred to the top screen of the service, and so on, each of which is a single operation. So let me go back to the automation policy, and next is a specific policy regarding the tools to be used. As for the back end, we can uh, Right, the scenario uh, with YAML, and because we can use Go or language to describe, and uh, uh, excuse me, and also there is a functionality to organize parts of the scenario by behavior units. We have a policy to use a scenario basically, and the scenario executes uh, batches in different ways, but the execution itself can be done. So we made policy to unify the tools across the back end, however, if it's possible to reduce the overall cost by extending, extending the in-house tool, then the internal tool should be used. Front-end apps basically follow the status quo. After understanding the trend of automation and having established the policy, we next consider the handling policy. We found that the backend team seemed to be the most willing to automate, so we decided to focus our support on the backend teams for now. We also decided to prioritize support for services that have not yet been automated or the ones that have regression tests regularly but not automated yet. We also decided to hold a priority study session to deepen understanding of how to use the tools as there was a demand from the teams to know how to use the tools and also uh, they had to be used in operation. As a result, the uh, the direction of the automation team was changed. The red portion were uh, adaptable, uh, excuse me, changed, updated. So added specific actions of creating infrastructure and infrastructure and conducting study sessions. Next, I will briefly introduce what we did to create automation infra. Basically, we made a policy of using scenarios, so we took care of setting up the scenario. 
Also, uh, if the use of in-house tools were involved in test operation, we listened to the users and uh, implemented process with plugin of scenario and adjusted them for automation. Next, I'd like to briefly introduce the creation of an automated test. We created an automated test according to a very uh, according to a policy. So it, it was very simple. We also shared what we created in the study session and encouraged the entire QA team to deepen their understanding of the tool. We also gave advice on how to implement it on a consultation basis. However, even though we were an automation team, we are a one-person team. So uh, we, I felt that I was limited in the amount of work I could do. So I decided to focus on a higher priority project to support. I focused on the support on the automation as a product team. And so leaving the development engineer to do what they can do. These are the actions done. Now I'd like to introduce a result of the team and the challenges for the future. As a result, we were able to visualize the status of this automation. We were able to set up a foundation for automation and provide the environment for the automation. As a result, several teams were able to take the first step towards automation. Also by establishing automation, Automation policy, we are able to give direction as to what we should do with automation. Our issue is that the adding and maintaining the cases still seem to be difficult, but I think we need to continue to address this issue with patience. Also, I like to have QA engineers involvement at some point in the future, as the automation of the apps has not been started yet. Also, although not a direct result, the automation policy was established this time it has been uh, leveraged in other new projects. So I think we are heading in the right direction. To summarize what we did, we, we created a team to promote test automation. As activities, we organize the current status. We find out the current status of the test automation, supported building a, um, automation infrastructure, and supported writing test codes and the health study sessions on support tools. By assessing the current situation, we found that it would be great if the backend automation would progress. So we focused on the automation uh, mainly for the backend team. Also, as for the tools used, the backend team, it, you know, back end you uh, use the scenario, Postman in-house tools, and the front end teams use Cypress, apps use XUI and Espresso. We also established an automation policy. We decided to use one tool instead of many, and we use scenario for the back end and the Cypress for front end and uh, uh, S XCUI and Espresso for apps. And uh, we also decided that the test code should be written based on the uh, scenario so that they in, uh, anyone can understand. Um, and lastly, I felt the importance of all teams members acting with quality in mind when promoting an automation. In other words, uh, I felt the limit of what I could do by myself. So uh, we are always looking for more people who are boosting test automation. If you are interested in the test automation, please let us know. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. I, that was Mr. Takano from Merpe QA. Uh, Takano san, you seem to be on mute. Excuse me. So here we will have a Q&A session. And by the way, I will be moderating the QA. I am from I am engineering manager of Merpe QA. I am Genki Kobayashi. Okay. Uh, if there are questions on the chat, uh, we would like to answer them, but there are no questions yet. But uh, we are still receiving questions. If you have 
So it can be any questions. If you have any questions, please uh, post that on YouTube live chat or Twitter. So while we are waiting for questions from the audience, I would like to ask some questions. So uh, starting with some frequently asked questions. You said you were doing many things right now, but you mentioned that your initial challenge was lack of manpower. Have you achieved any results through these activities? So this uh, question comes up quite a lot. So we have not been able to obtain any directly useful results at the moment. Uh, but it is an issue that will be addressed going forward. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's a lack of people who can write test code in terms of maintenance. So I feel that if we don't clear this, it will be difficult to clear the original issue. So uh, you mentioned in the conclusion that uh, so you have made progress in laying the groundwork to resolve the issues. So you have made your first step, but has not been able to, to really uh, solve the challenge. So let's work together. So with relate to that, I have a question. So in the, recently, you, you in recent days, you haven't got a fruitful result, but um, this uh, work was done about a half about a six month ago, right? And you continue to work, but uh, it's been a six month. So what is the update in recent, in recent months? Yeah, to be honest with you, in terms of a project, I wasn't able to produce much impact on the project, but uh, they are more uh, active about the um, automation within the QA. And so I guess that uh, we hope that uh, we will uh, actually make it as a regular operation. Yes, you are continuing your efforts. And this is related to the first question's answer. So you are building the uh, foundation, but you don't have uh, enough resources. So therefore, you are not making the significant impact yet. But then um, you know, awareness among the QA members is changing, which is uh, positive. And also, you wanted to reduce the cost, uh, which was the original purpose, but uh, it it didn't happen yet. But so, uh, you know, you have to uh, solve the issues of the insufficient resources, right? And yes, you have a lot of issues and you try, but uh, there are some issues. So there are still no questions on the chat. So we will continue with our questions. So this is also connected to the previous question. So you said uh, you want to really put this into the operations. But to do that, you need to uh, increase people who can write test codes. So what actions are you taking now? To address this issue, you talked about uh, holding study sessions in the presentation. So do you have any new actions that you are taking to increase the number of people who can apply the codes? And what are the challenges here? So maybe uh, this will overlap a little bit with my, my presentation. I think there are two types of challenges, lack of time in the first place and technical difficulties. For members who are not able to uh, have enough time, uh, we so we urge them to really uh, coordinate so that they can estimate the time. And if they are struggling to do the estimation, if they can consult us, uh, we can give uh, them a rough estimate on the man hours required. It required. So this is how we intend to cover the former uh, challenge. Regarding the latter technical issues, we will hold study sessions to deepen understanding little by little. So as for difficulties, we have a problem that we don't get any consultation in the first place. So 
if we say, please consult us if you face problems, uh, in that case, we don't get any consultation. So it's difficult to grasp the situation unless we collect information from our side. Yeah, I agree. Right. Yes, the technical capability has to be improved. But then uh, the, if you said, please come to me and talk to me, but then uh, they don't come, they hesitate to come. And so that's difficult to change. If you are alone doing this, you know, you have a uh, uh, lot of things you have to do. So you, it's difficult for you to go and find the people who need the support. But uh, there are many Slack channels, so uh, you don't know where to look at either. So you are doing, but you don't know how how far you should do. So that's also one other issue, I think. Uh, we received one question. Thank you for your question. Regarding the app tests, so do you have any tools in mind to introduce? Takano-san, Takano -san, do you have any tools? Other than the tools that I talked about, right? Yes. In this context, in the presentation, I talked about issues and regarding the technical challenges. For To solve the technical challenges, I'd like to take a new action. That's we are discussing within a team. The app is the slowest in automation. So because the technical barrier is very high, so Swift and Kotlin has to be learned in order to write the test codes. So for QA team, the hurdle is high. And so to solve that for the app side, no code tool, no coding tools could be applied. And maybe it will be effective that's what we are discussing. So I'd like to refrain from mentioning the names of the tool, but uh, it's a no-coding tool for application or services that are, I'd like. That's uh, what we do like to apply. Yes, for the back end, within the pay, uh, maybe we can apply the scenario. I think that's the mainstream, I think. Scenario and we the back end uh, we are not we facing any problems so far, but uh, it's good if we can uh, uh, make it more f efficient. So we are now considering the tools, but we still don't know which tools can be used. So we are considering implementing low code tools. And by doing so, we expect uh, we will be able to have some efficiency gains. But we don't really have a name of the tool yet. But we are uh, considering some generally available tools. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Oh, there's another question. So do you have any thoughts on how to make the app tests more efficient? I think uh, the questioner is talking about automated tests. And this is an area that QA has not yet been able to start. We have not yet uh, been able to start considering but uh, Takano-san, do you have any thoughts that you can uh, give here to proceed with app tests more efficiently? I would like to apply automation. And maybe this uh, overlaps with my previous answer. So I'm, we are thinking about first changing the tools to be used. And in the long run, we would like to think about automation that can QA, that QAs can handle. And to this end, 
we want to really uh, bring in people and uh, work on it. And and from another perspective, uh, there are uh, there's, there's a problem of uh, too many regression tests. So we want to narrow down on the regression tests and really classify them. So these are the thoughts that come up into my mind. And, and I cannot give the details, but there's app regression tests. Uh, Mercari and Merpay uh, releases frequently, so there are many app tests. And regression tests, we have continued to revise the content of the regression test, uh, but uh, there, this is there's still quite a large number of regression tests, and I think uh, many people think this as a problem. And if we can uh, reduce these tests through automation, that will be very very helpful. Though so we want to also think about that. Sorry, uh, we may not be able to answer to your question directly, but uh, sorry, that is our uh, answer. So I don't like to answer to uh, one or two more questions. Uh, I got um, another question came in. Automate, so automatic generation of the test cases, is that included? Uh, in your work? No, it's not included at this point of time. We, the, we people manually create a test case and then we think about the uh, automation of that test. So uh, test case is not automatically created yet. But uh, we don't have a plan to do that. But by doing so, you know, if we can reduce the uh, efforts significantly while maintaining the quality, I think it's worthwhile looking into it. What do you think? Yes, exactly. I completely agree with you on that. Maybe one thing I can share with you is that rather than a test cases, but the test, code, uh, test codes automatic generation it's close to it, but uh, some teams using the uh, in-house in tools uh, uh, by listing the uh, combination of the conditions and uh, based on that, uh, they generate the um, test codes and then execute that test codes. So if that works with other teams, then it's possible that a wall will roll it out across the um, multiple teams, but it's not our effort as a automation team. The test automatic generation, uh, I'm not very familiar with that. In my previous position, uh, there was a person who is in, was in charge of that. But there are some common perspectives, right? Like a common perspective perspective which I use all the time. Maybe for those perspectives, maybe you can automate that. Uh, but for the uh, perspective which changes often or the new perspectives per specific to a particular functionality, uh, I don't know how to automatically generate the test codes for that. I, I'm not quite sure whether there's any tools or not, but so on. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, that activity is not included in our activity, but uh, there are some similar activities. So if it can be applied to across the different teams, we will roll it out. So it's the time. So well, we would like to close the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you very much for viewing. And there, please uh, fill in uh, the survey. So we would like to close here. Thank you for watching.
Let me begin. Today's presentation is titled Microservice Dashboard Introduction and Deep Dive, presented by Merupay's Uexa. In this session, I will introduce the dashboard we are developing for microservices. I would like to share with you how the microservice dashboard solves issues that have emerged in the course of operating microservices and the functions and mechanisms used to solve them. Thank you for your attention. First of all, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Ue Kusa, and I'm a member of the engineering productivity team. As for my background, I joined Merpe in January 2018 and was involved in the development of several microservices as tech lead. I moved to the Arctic team and was involved in the development of the API gateway and the dashboard for the microservices I am going to talk about. I continue to work on the development of microservices dashboard in the engineering productive team, which separated from the architect team in January of this year. So here is what I will discuss today. First, what is a microservice dashboard? I'd like to briefly introduce how we came to develop this service. Next. I'd like to focus on five of the features, technology stacks, and architectures we use in our microservices dashboard and explain how they work in detail. Finally, in the secondary use of data through APIs, I will introduce the APIs provided by microservice dashboard and actual use cases. Let me first tell you what a microservice dashboard is and the background behind its development. In a nutshell, the microservice dashboard is an in-house service that aims to collect and visualize information on all microservices. Anyone with an employee account can easily access and browse the microservice information. We also provide the collected data via API so that it can be utilized by other systems. I will provide more details on actual API use cases later. As Merpay grew, it, be it became increasingly difficult to keep track of information on each microservice while they uh, were being operated. For example, when you want to know the overview of, ser of a service, what SLOs are defined, and the team members developing the service, the Slack channel to talk about the service, and the pager duty settings for on-call, it was big. It was a big task since we you need to check them one by one. To make tracking such information as easy as possible, we had been compiling each of the microservice information into an uh, compiling each of the informa microservice information into an uh, internal wiki as an operational document but as Merpay's de development scale grew it became difficult to cover all services and keep updating the information therefore we eliminated managing this operational dashboard and started developing the dashboard around December 2019 with the goal of easily tracking microservice information. In this section, we'd like to introduce the functions and structure of the microservice dashboard in detail. These are the technology stacks we are using. The backend is implemented in Go. We use Cloud Spanner PubSub and Scheduler for GCP services. APIs are GraphQL and gRPC. The front end is implemented in TypeScript. We use React for the front end and Material UI for the UI tools. Data for display is obtained from GraphQL. Next is the architecture of the microservice dashboard, which is a single page application. 
to reduce operational cost, Go service deliver front-end build files. Authentication for the web app uses Google OAuth, which allows any employee account to log in. There are also two APIs, gRPC and GraphQL. gRPC is available to receive Cloud PubSub and scheduler requests. The request comes in the form of an HTTP request, and the API Gateway converts it to gRPC through a common mechanism. The GraphQL API is provided to allow other systems to utilize data. It is available using the credentials of the Google service account. I will then discuss the functions and mechanisms of the microservice dashboard, focusing on these five features it has. To begin with, I will introduce the functions of introduce the function of visualizing the features in the service. This is intended to make tracking microservice information easily. By providing an at-a-glance overview of the service, the team members developing it, and the stack channels to talk about services, we hope to help developers understand not only their own service, but also other services. We also expect this is used as one of the onboarding materials for new team members. There are two main types of data that are collected to compile information on microservices. The first is the microservice starter kit. Melpay uses a tool called microservice starter kit to build microservices. This tool is a Terraform module provided by the platform team that will, be, that will automatically prepare the infrastructure resources needed for the initial construction of microservices. The starter kit defines an ID called a service ID that uniquely identifies a service. And the microservice dashboard uses that ID to summarize information. The second is microservice spec. Information in microservices include metadata that cannot be expressed by the starter kit alone, which declarity relatively manage infrastructure resources. To express such metadata, a definition called microservices specification is provided. Specifically, it is a YAML file called service.yaml, which can describe an overview of the service, links to Slack, channels, and documentation, and so on. The structure of the YAML file is defined in protobuf. By defining the structure with protobufs, input validation and message marshalling are made easier to handle mechanically. These starter kits and spec files are maintained in a GitHub repository, specifically called Microservices Terraform. The Microservices Terraform repository has become a mono-repository of Terraform files for over hundreds of microservices. Each service has its own directory, and the Terraform files and spec files, including the starter kit configuration, are located in a structure like this. Here is a di diagram of how the microservice starter kit collects data. The starter kit data is obtained by Git cloning the microservices Terraform repository and passing the starter kit Terraform files. Acquired data is grouped by service ID and stored in a database. This process is triggered by the cloud scheduler and executed twice a day. Microservices spec files are linked by a PubSub push distribution. Spec files are published from CI in the microservices Terraform repository. The spec file is converted from YAML to JSON and from JSON to protopath messages when publishing. 
by converting to a protobuf message, any undefined figures will result in an error which can be noticed there. We also use a plugin called ProtoCGen Validate to check, it, to check input. When the microservice dashboard receives a PubSub message, it processes it into a more manageable form and stores in it in the database. Basically, we publish messages triggered by file change, but we also publish all microservices spec files once a day in case they are missed. And here is a visualization of the collected microservice information. This service list shows all microservices and the teams, descriptions, and others associated with them. The data is also used for inventory microservices. This is the service overview screen. It contains information such as Slack links and documentations. So if you want to know basic information about microservices, this screen will give you the general idea. Information about the team is available through the Microservices Team Kit. Melpay uses a tool called Microservices Team Kit to manage the team. This tool, as well as the Starter Kit, is a Terraform module provided by the platform team that allows for declarative management of the team's member list and permissions to resources. You can tie the Team kit from the starter kit, and the microservice dashboard also ties the service to the team based on that information. The data for the team kit is collected using the same mechanism as the starter kit described earlier. Here is a screen visualizing the team's information collected. Team members are listed, and it is easy to see at a glance who is in which role. GitHub accounts and Slack mentions are also collected as data, which can be tracked on this screen. The ability to clearly identify the roles of each team member has made it easier to find out who the manager is when, for example, I need to consult with another team's manager. Next, I will cover the function to visualize the information assets of the services. The purpose of this function is to allow us to understand what information assets the microservices hold. By systematically managing the information assets held in microservices, we can streamline the inventory of information and understanding the importance of the service will be useful in analyzing information security measures. The information assets of the service are currently data-based for personal information only. The classification of personal information is defined in protobuf and can be described in the spec file as metadata for the microservice. Each microservice owner is responsible for describing the information assets they manage in the spec file. The classification of personal information is defined by a matrix of personal information categories and types of personal information. The importance of the service, which is defined, determined by the combination of the classification and type, is defined in the same way. For example, if there is a combination of a customer category and a credit card type of information, the level of information is top secret. Here is the visualization of the con uh, collected data. The top column shows the personal data category and the left-hand row shows the type of personal data. In this example, the customer service cre credit information line is ticked. So you can see that the service has the customer's balance information and so on. It is also possible to automatically generate an information asset ledger based on the data collected. 
The information asset ledger is a document that summarizes the information assets handled by a department in order to manage them properly. In the past, they had to manually manage this document on a spreadsheet, which was very difficult, but now they are able to automatically generate it from the data they have collected, which has led to significant efficiency gains. This is now uh, we talk about the feature to visualize service dependencies. This feature is intended to, make, intended to make it easier to understand the callers and the call destinations of microservices. It enables developers to notice if they are receiving requests from unknown services or if they know of requests to unintended services. The service dependencies are each graphs based on three different sets of data. The first is the data doc service dependency API. Second is the network policy settings managed by the microservice Terraform repository. The third is the value set in the microservice environmental variable. We believe that the third data is most reliable, as almost all MelPay microservices set the destination of the request in the environmental variable. So today, we will show you how to create a dependency graph based on the third environmental variable. MelPay microservice runs on Kubernetes. Kubernetes provides a mechanism called controller that performs arbitrary processing in response to changes in the state of a specific resource. Using this mechanism, we are developing a custom controller to retrieve microservice environment variables. Specifically, pods and cron jobs are specified as resources handled by the custom controller, and the reconciliation process acquires environment valuables, including the config map in the namespace. From the retrieved environment valuables, strings that apply to the des destination pattern are extracted and stored in the database. Reconciling pod and Curon job resources is quite numerous, so the queuing system is used to regulate the flow of processing. Another problem is that the memory usage is quite high. Here is a visualization of the data collected in this way. The service in the blue frame on the left is the caller, and the service in the red frame on the right is the destination. In this example, you can see how the Kozo Echo JP service is receiving requests from the Mercury and Melpay gateway services and making requests to the Mercury Authority service. This is followed by a fun feature for visualizing the cost of services. This function is intended to help members of the organization to find services that can be cost optimized and for the development team to understand the status of a host of services. The information on the cost of services is based on data that the platform team aggregates into a big query every month. Currently, three types of costs are collected, GCP, GKE, and Datadog. Here is a diagram of the system for collecting information on the cost of services. Once a month, we execute a query to get the cost data in BigQuery, and the acquired data is grouped by service ID and stored in a database. Here is a screen visualizing the data collected this way. The monthly cost history is graphed for six months. Developers can look at this to see if there have been any changes in the cost status compared to the past. There's also a dashboard screen that summarizes the cost history for all microservices. This screen lists the cost history for each microservice. You can see the cost trends for all microservices for the past few months.
Finally, I will talk about the feature that visualizes the quality of the service. This feature aims to give members of the organization as well as the development team an overview of the reliability of the microservice. The Merpe SRE team is leading the development of this feature. To visualize quality, we use the status of the microservice SLOs. At Merpe, the SRD team has put in place the infrastructure to support the configuration of microservice SLOs. A Terraform module called SLO module is provided to declaratively manage the SLO monitoring of Datadogs, for example. Here is a diagram of the mechanism for collecting SLO status. The SLO module file is placed in the microservice Terraform, and when a resource is created in Datadog, the ID of that resource is linked to the microservice dashboard in PubSub. The microservice dashboard uses the ID of that resource to retrieve the SLO status from the Datadog API once a day and store it in the database. Here is a visualization of the data collected in this way. It shows the SLO history of the microservice and the SLO status of each monitor. The history can be checked on a weekly, monthly, and quarterly basis, making it easy to see whether the SLO has been maintain maintained for that period of time. We also have a dashboard screen that summarizes the SLO history of all microservices. This, this screen provides a list of whether SLOs have been maintained for each microservice. If any microservice is not maintaining its SLO, they will turn red as shown in the screen so that they can be easily identified. Finally, I will introduce the API provided by microservice dash dashboard and some examples of its use. Microservice dashboard provides an API to make effective use of collective data within the company. By normalizing various types of data and making them reusable, they can be used conveniently with, when similar data is needed in different use cases. We also hope that this will promote the automation of operations and improve productivity. This API is not only available from the system, but also for individual users. The main reason for adopting GraphQL was that we simply wanted to use, try it out, but after actually using it, we feel that its flexibility, which is not bound by use cases, is a good match for the API in microservice dashboards, where it is impossible to predict how it will be used. Now I will talk about two examples of actual use cases. The first is an example of individual use. Sometimes I ask microservices to respond to a request via Slack at here or other means, uh, but some microservices don't seem to respond to my request. In such case, you can directly comment on the microservice owner and ask for support. But if there are multiple microservices like that, it can be difficult to find out where to comment. This is where the API is used to collect all of the comment destination at once. This is an example of using curl to extract data. The diagram shows how to obtain an ID token for authentication, pass the necessary queries as parameters, and make a request and the data is returned as a result of the execution. This example shows a query to retrieve the mentions of all team members from the team resources associated with a service resource. 
This kind of data extraction is available to anyone with an internal account, as long as they follow the instructions and register to use the API. Second is an example of a systematic use of the system. Merpe uses a tool called Carrier for temporary authorization. Carrier is a tool developed by the platform team that allows users to request DCP or Kubernetes roles for a given service. When the service owner approves the request, a temporary authorization is, is granted. This is used when there is a need to work in production environment, for example. Carrier has an input form like the screen on the left. When the information required to make an authorization request is entered in this form, a notification is sent to the Slack channel of the specified service asking for approval of the request, as shown in the screen on the right. The API is used to check the service ID entered behind this process and to retrieve the Slack channel to be notified. The reason for this from the system is available by following the instructions to register a service account. I will summarize. Today, I introduced the microservice dashboard which we are developing. In order to collect and visualize information from all microservices, it is necessary to organize the information. In order to bring the information together, we need to uh, put the information together. At Merpe, the declarative management of microservice information with regularity using infrastructure as a code, which is maintained by the platform team, was a great advantage in organizing the information. We will continue to manage the data we collect in a form uh, that can be expressed as a code going forward. I also hope to continue expanding the use of API as part of our internal ecosystem. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. So we would like to start the QA session for this microservice QA dive. So I am in charge of this. I'm an MC for this QA session. Um, my name is Tomo, Tono Mori. And I'm an engineering manager for the architect team. And we would like to take questions from the audience on YouTube as well as Twitter. YouTube as well as Twitter. So if you have any questions, since the questions are still accepted, please ask questions. And on the Twitter, please apply the hashtag MailPayTechFest. Then the questions will be accepted. So please post questions utilizing this hashtag. So, Wixasan, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm checking whether there are any questions or not. Well, I don't think there are any questions yet. So, actually, just when, just in case, we prepared some questions in advance. So, I, I would like to ask you some questions. So, there are many functions and features in microservices dashboard, and you talked about many in your presentation. And not everyone can you play with these services. So mainly the developers are the ones who enjoy and play with such kind of services. So what are the functions and features that are mostly commonly used by those developers? So in microservice dashboard, Google Analytics is deployed. So we can check how long each screen is viewed. And based on that statistics, so the detail screen of microservices is the most commonly checked. And 
there are various services available, such as Slack channels, as well as the development team information, and also the definition of the services, as well as the key points for service environment and the production environment. So I think this page is used to check those in my idea. And also SLO dashboard as well as course dashboard. Those would provide the overview of the total services. So these are also checked, I think. Thank you very much. So being able to view uh, across services, I think, is a big uh, benefit. Uh, and looking weekly, monthly, uh, as quarterly SLO to be able to visualize that. And also for the developers and those who manage IT risk, I think this will be a very convenient feature for them. So we would like to move on to the next question. This is an internal facing tool. And this also applies to me, but when backend engineers build the front end, that really happens for internal tools. And in case of our company, they tell us to, they take it for granted that we can all develop management tools like jQuery, Bootstrap, and front end stack is trending or so these new technologies are being incorporated. And fixating on UI UX, there are so much information. So being able to view that and any, and also uh, putting those together so that people will not misinterpret. So are you doing those things to make the data uh, display clear. So this is an area that we have not been able to work on much. Ja, we are reference, referring to the GCP Cloud Console when we uh, thought of the layout of the display screen. And developers can, uh, there's many, much, many, much, much opportunity to, for the developers to uh, operate the cloud console. So, the, so that's why uh, we learned a lot from cloud, cloud console and we are working so that it's easy for us to navigate. And many tools are coming up but if we really fixate too much on the details, it will be never ending. And, and especially MUI is use, being used and you can do the filtering. And recently export features have been added. And I'm, I'm one of the users who use the dashboard and up till now, I had to write GraphQL myself and run the API and uh, put together the data in JQ. And you need to filter from web UI and export on CSV. And these features were available. And I feel it's, things are really improving on a daily basis. So may I? I think I can still continue QA time. So I have five more minutes. So I think this might be the last question. So I think there should be some improvement aspect. So there is a lot of information collected for the secondary use. So more like an input output. And there are many more functions added and enhanced. So for the future, what type of roadmap do you have for the features and functions that you would like to add? Yes, as a big policy, microservice dashboard should collect information for the sake of microservices. But there are many things that had not been visualized yet. 
So one by one, we would like to implement those. And as for the recent one, so the organizational information is not complete yet at all. So from the point of audit as well, there it's not unsatisfactory yet. So this can cause issues. So those will be the very important prioritized areas. And also that the data linkage as well as graph, making up a graph for the data. It requires uh, much development cost. So we would like to make it easier. So we'd like to come up with a mechanism that would make it easier. Okay, thank you very much. So little by little, microservice dashboard. So there we have, this is a service with the title microservice. And this will be linking to various systems within the company and data will be linked together. And there may be features that really do not pertain to the name microservice. So I'm saying this in a good way. So linking together organizations, many people are managing this through spreadsheets, So since everything is so manual, when someone in charge uh, moves to another department or leaves the company, we need to really find the people who know about the system within the company. So that's really costly. So if we can really overcome these uh, problems, uh, this will be very good from a manager perspective. Okay, it seems like no qu more questions. So we have some more minutes, but we would like to end this Q&A session. Thank you very much, Uekusa san Thank you indeed. Yeah, thank you very much. So the more and more stories and Melpe Tech Fest continues. So I would like you to fill in the survey and if you have any questions, please write down your questions in that survey as well. We try to follow up as much as possible. So thank you very much indeed. And we would like to conclude this QA session. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Goodbye. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining Melfe Tech Fest. I'd like to share with you the story of the payment infrastructure that has been built at Melpay. First, 
I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm called Fogust, Hoghost, which is my slap name. I am a software, en software engineer at Melpay, and I joined Melgali in November 2016 and um, participated in the launch of Melpay since since then, I've been involved in the development of the payment infrastructure, and I'm currently the tech lead of the payment infrastructure, infrastructure or uh, the um, settlement infrastructure team. I'd like to give a, a excuse, yes, and first, this is the agenda. I will briefly introduce the settlement infrastructure, and then I'd like to talk about some of the domains. First, the we I uh, the vision of the payment or the settlement infrastructure team is to provide the best uh, settlement infrastructure infrastructure to the product team and to achieve the mission of the entire Melkari group. So currently, we provide not only Melpay payment or the settlement function. Uh, we also provide our payment infra, uh, you know, uh, like a free up, free up, as well as a payment function for Merugari shop uh, via our payment infrastructure. And in the middle, payment infra sets, which is consists of four domains, and uh, the front ones are the services in charge of the settlement processes, and behind that is the domain in charge of managing the wallets and the books of the customers, and then the payment domain, which takes care of the proceeds of the merchants, and then uh, there is a domain in which it takes care of a connection with external payment platform. So today, I'd like to talk first about the domain for managing wallet and books. So first, I would like to talk about the definition of a settlement or payment, which is a little bit probably different depending on the person's image or on the actual situation. So from a development standpoint, when we create the infrastructure, we define the settlement in this way. In economic transaction, we define the settlement or payment as the exchange and transfer of value by manipulating the wallets of the participants. Then, the first thing that comes out of this is the source of payment, which are the customer's wallets, which manage the value and the payment accounts. So in case of MailPay, there are two types of customers, individuals and merchants, and each one has different type of wallets. I'll give you some examples of the wallets for individual customers here. The top one is the internal payment account, uh, the internal wallet. And so um, funds accounts, sales accounts, and uh, the free point accounts, which is for managing points, and uh, MailPay uh, provides a smart payment, which is a payment with a credit line, so they can have a credit accounts and a debt account as well. And also, customers like have users external uh, payment, they can have a credit card already connected to the system and a connected bank accounts for debt debiting and crediting, which are also managed by the system. And in case of a merchant's wallet, that is a partner sales account to which the money is accrued every time the payment is made. And this is the unsettled sales. And then after the payment process is completed, the finalized sales uh, goes into this 
the clearing partner sells the gun, and then, well, if the sales are processed as debt, then it goes into the clearing partner debt account. And uh, as for the merchant's external payment accounts, basically the bank account is registered for debiting fraud purposes, and it is managed in the system as well. So the next step is to operate each of these accounts the, uh, to do the uh, clearing. The value fluctuates when payment is processed and cleared, and it's important to keep track uh, fluctuation. So therefore, I will talk about a manage, management of books and the ledger. The actual shape and design of the books may vary based on the purpose of bookkeeping. What this means is that, for example, a payment request comes comes in uh, like this, and the payment after it is processed, then the payment system, if there is a change in the customer's balance, the system in the middle here called the ledger management system post the changes of balance and the same kind of payment process data are also fed into accounting system and posted on the ledger in the accounting system and with some accounts due to the legal requirement for example for a fund account the aggregate Aggregation of debts and the credits for customers need to manage on a daily basis. Uh, therefore, the requirement of the book is determined by the legal requirement. So the legal account bookkeeping is also done on a daily basis. In today's session, we are going to talk about how the system bookkeeping works when the customer's balance is changed. Uh, the system books work like this. For each type of customer's account, there is an account of which balance is managed by the system using the balance item. It manages the detail of the balance. The balance item manages the detail of the balance. Each crediting of balance is managed as one record, and, and when the balance is used, which uh, transition on used, the balance is tracked in the system and logged in the balance item. And snapshot and a snapshot manages the status of a balance item based on the changes recorded in the balance item logs. Each of balance items is managed. So if you go back to one before, you can see how much balance changed at one point of time and find out the status at that point of time. That's how you use the snapshot. So that's the that's how the system book keeping works. And next. about wallet and bookkeeping. So we are working on a new system and we are trying to reduce the amount of that development as much as possible, amount of the coding as much as possible. And we are aiming to make it available to the product team as soon as a new account type is added without much coding. So the challenge is uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, there are many types of internal settlement accounts. 
And in fact, if you look at the details, for example, in the case of fund accounts, there is no expiration date, uh, but there are limits for consumption and overdue. And so no automatic creation. So it means that unless the customer applies for that account, it will not be created. On the other hand, for example, if it's a free point account, then it has an expiration date and it's automatically created when the point is awarded. So it's like this, actually, depending on the type of account, the operation may change a bit. But so far, in the, fa in the past, we've been modifying the logic of the system on the application side. And after the proper testing to avoid the negative impact to the existing behavior uh, is done, uh, we provide new develop, uh, newly developed account types. But now, in order to keep the cost of our development as low as possible, we are thinking of a new design that uh, defines each behavior, such as no expiration dates, as an attribute. And when the attribute is attached, the related behavior will happen. So when you have a new account type, by just configuring the attributes that already exist, you can create a new account type that can be provided to the product team. If you define the config properly, yes, new account types can be provided. So there were all about wallets and bookkeeping. But next, I'd like to introduce to move, move the wallets to perform the settlement process. First of all, uh, the pro I talked about the settlement processes. Uh, but uh, yes, there are always participants. The participants include the individual customers, merchants, and mail pay itself. So when you look at it as a payment process, or settlement process, for example, when a customer makes a payment to a merchant, the merchant payment process runs. And if the customer actually uses the wallet on the left-hand side to pay for the merchant services, the value of the payment can be transferred to the merchant's wallet through the merchant payment process. Also, there is a function of person-to-person -person transfer between individual customers, which is a kind of settlement process, and it's a transfer transfer of the balance between individuals. And also, the payment processing between individual customers and the mail pay, such as deposit and withdrawals, or repayment of debts, and also the payment of sales between merchants and mail pay, are abstracted as payment processing and batches, batches are created. And then, when developing these payment processes, first, from a design point of view, how should we design them? Uh, well, when we thought of them, uh, how to model, how to model it, we have to think about four elements. First, who are the participants? And then the what types of payment account for the payer and the receivers. And also, when it is made into a single payment process, Shall we shall we make it uh, shall we uh, make it so that it can be done all in one action or whether it has a multiple steps to process the payment? The type of payment and the type of the settlement account to receive the payment are determined by the type of payments. So uh, we can open an app for each action. 
uh, depending on these elements, actual actions will differ. So the separate API for each action can be prepared. Let me use the next example. This is an actual being used in the Mercari escrow transaction. So this is a payment method called escrow payment. In case of Mercari, it's a C2C escrow transaction. So the participants are individual customers and individual buyers and sellers. First, buyers can use their own payment accounts. When you buy something from Mercari, you pay for it first. And when that happens, create escrow process runs for the payment. And if it is successful, then the Mercari makes deposit to the merchant sales account. And then when the transaction is completed, and both parties have finished evaluating each other's transaction, we need to distribute the sales to the sell sellers. This is one of the actions of escrow. So we do that process. And then after that, the proceeds goes into seller's wallet. Let me explain another example. This is a charge payment for merchants offered by MailPay. Usually on the front, we offer code payment, ID payment, or online payment. From the point of the payment foundation, basically, the participants are individual customers and the merchants who receive payment. Individual customers will be first provisionally processed using their available payment accounts through this create charge. After this provisional processing, the status of the payment is in the state of the provisional sales, sales, and in this state, the sales is not confirmed to the merchant. Only the balance or credit held by the customer is being held down here. Then, when the next action of finalization is accepted, the balance of the customer's payment for the consumption is finalized and the sales is given to the merchant. Thus, in designing, we carefully consider the four points mentioned earlier and organize them accordingly. If the expect, uh, extended existing payment process can cover the required processes, we extend and apply it. If not, we develop a new process in abstraction. That is all for the design. So next, I would like to discuss some points from a development and operational perspective. So this is about the integrity assurance, which is always a problem for those who actually provide payment services. So let me explain what it means. When you do a payment processing, it is rarely completed within the same service. In the case of MailPay, since it employs microservices, when you make a payment, you need to interact with multiple microservices, or for example, when you make a credit card payment, you need to interact with an external payment service. If there is a failure in the external service on which we depend, or in the middle network layer, an unexpected error occurs. In this case, it is necessary to complete the payment process successfully or fail to roll back correctly. I covered the integrity assurance of the payment service in detail in my blog some time ago. So if you are interested in going over the details, I hope you could refer to my blog. Today I will show you roughly how we do it. 
This is basically close to Saga concept. Within a payment service, a state machine diagram based mechanism is created. So, single payment process is divided into multiple states, each of which can be defined and executed as state machine. Suppose some error has occurred and it cannot be recovered by retries or other means, so we can define a state machine called rollback as a compensation process on the right. So the rollback process is called, and if by some chance the customer has already spent the balance due to a failed credit card transaction, we fail we fail this transaction to cancel all including the transaction and the balance spent. That way, even when an abnormal error occurs, it can be automatically retried or rolled back if necessary, so that the integrity at the source from the customer's point and money's perspective is ultimately ensured. There is also a recent new approach to the payment integrity. I don't have much time for this session, but I'll give you a quick overview. The state machine diagram I mentioned earlier was created in the payment service, but since other teams have similar issues, we like to carve this out as a general solution as an SDK. But when we provide it as an SDK, one point of the reflection so far is that in defining processes based on a state machine diagram, some parts were a bit unnatural for developers. We want to improve the programming experience there. So now in the new system, we are providing a workflow and interface like this so that you can build logic in a way that is relatively similar to normal programming. For example, as you see in the upper right, there is a certain workflow function that can be executed by passing it a parameter. If you look at the contents of that workflow, each of them is the same process as before. Each activity can be defined as a state and executed by passing activity functions and parameters. If this is assembled in a workflow function in a normal programming, a workflow is created that can be executed with the same assurance of consistency. On the back end, the workflow engine is saving each execution log if it goes down somewhere, it can be rerun later, starting from that point. So if a rollback is needed, the compensation process can be started in the same way as is described on the right. The last point I would like to talk about is the domain of merchant payment adjustment or clearing. From high level, this clearing has two parts, or adjustment has two parts, clearing and settlement. So first, clearing. Clearing is the process of correctly calculating the merchant's unsettled sales or commissions and establishing them as the final sales. Secondly, settlement. This is the process of actually transferring the confirmed sales to the merchant, or if there is a credit, billing the customer for that payment, repayment. This is the overview of the adjustment process. When a merchant payment request comes in from a higher layer, it is processed by the service responsible for payment processing. 
and payment events receive adjustment service from time to time. And if fee clearing is required, then immediate fee clearing will be performed. And the final sales is determined. And at the timing of that adjustment, the sales clearing process is also executed to finalize the sales. The confirmed sales is called sales settlement here. In effect, it is a wire transfer action where a transfer request is made to the merchant's registered bank account via the bank connection. One important point is that if the payment data that forms the basis of the adjustment is not correct, the merchant will receive the wrong sales amount. So we also reconcile data from time to time for important services to ensure that the original data is reliable. Regarding the reconciliation part, there is a new initiative that I would like to share with you. This was actually also mentioned briefly in last year's tech blog in Reconciliation Story. One of the challenges we face now is how to prove the integrity of the payment process. Here is the entry uh, payment request. If there are multiple microservices used, including a payment foundation, after the processing, each microservice needs to be verified to ensure that it is operated correctly as and it is operating as we expect, expect it. For this reason, we have been doing the reconciliation process between each microservices, as the slide shows. Each microservice performs reconciliation with its, in, uh, with its dependent services from time to time, either in batch or event-driven fashion. But we feel there are two issues that need to be, that need to be addressed. Firstly, since there is no enforced reconciliation mechanism, if you forget, forget to implement a batch in some microservices, there is a risk of incomplete confirmation on an overall consistency because the consistency of that part is not finally confirmed. Or even if all microservices were done properly. For example, if we want to check the consistency of a certain payment process or how the process, how the whole process went, we currently have to provide APIs to the related microservices to check them. We share the similar issues in accounting and auditing. So we want to obtain evidence to prove the overall consistency in one place. But at present, this is not available. So as a new initiative, this distributed processing tracing mechanism described below is being created right now. If you're familiar with the distributed tracing mechanism, this will be easy to understand. Usually, for example, when looking at a request, each request has a trace ID or a request ID, which is then processed by each microservice or service. You can then attach a distributed span ID or something like that. And for example, with Datadoc, you can check how multiple requests are processed across multiple microservices. Similarly, when a payment process is created, the entry service defines it as a processing and registered it to this processing tracing service. 
after you register you notify the entry service number two in the slide that you are participating that you are participating this notification and we have then we have them perform the first entry services the task processing done in the batch so far and the necessary dependent services and then the results are reported if there are no problems. This is number four. In the report you see, you can see the results are okay as well as dependent services of the entry services. So the reported service is now recognized as a participant and notifies the payment service by the same second event. And in the same way, when payment service receives notification, the same task processing as dependent services are processed and the results are reported. If there are any dependent services among them, they will be reported. And repeating such a process to the end, all participating microservices in the payment process will be recognized. You can also get a report on the results of the services process or the task results of the dependent service. Then, evidence that can prove the overall consistency, which is the second issue I talked about, will be collected in this processing tracing. Also, for issue number one, Common mechanism for processing will provide a more compulsory mechanism than before. I went a little over my time, but let me summarize today's session. First, we talked about the overall domain structure of the payment foundation and then introduced the design and development practices of several domains. Recent initiatives in each of these domains were also presented. That concludes today's session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you indeed. Good afternoon, everyone. So now we'd like to start the current time of the uh, uh, settlement uh, foundation or platform. So I'm a Kotrick and I'm, I'm a facilitator. I'm the engineer manager of a backend team. And so we will accept the questions from the audience. And so please use the YouTube live or Twitters to post your questions. So let's get started. Uh, thank you very much, Fog Host San, for your presentation. So, I'd like to ask you a question. So, uh, what is the uh, most exciting thing for you in the development of the settlement domain? Yes, I'm always uh, excited, but uh, so there are two viewpoints products and the development technology. For the products uh, viewpoints, uh, we can um, you know, for the EC domains and the strategy domain, I mean, fintech domains, for both domains, the settlement uh, is important. And for the uh, different services and uh, with the settlement that the, you can provide, you can offer the different services. Of course, there are many issues that we have to uh, solve as the business expands. So uh, there are a lot, lot of room to grow. So that is the most exciting thing. And but for the tech viewpoint, there are many products. But uh, if we develop the settlement uh, for each uh, product, then it's going to be very uh, complicated. So we have to find something common, and so that we can. Uh, delivers the common and the enforcing uh, settlement solutions 
so uh, of course i'm not quite sure whether i it's possible or not but uh, if i can do so it will be very exciting so i've been challenging every day so that is very exciting but there is a lot to do so uh, for both products and the technology yes on the in your presentation today yes you talked about the very difficult uh technology so that sounds exciting so let me ask the second question so in the payment as well as for your life so workload and state machine there are two methodologies are used in your teams what are the differences how do you make distinction about these so i just touched upon in uh, on my presentation so from the point of the developers the main difference would be about interface so as for the execution systems in uh, the state transfer. So we need to be conscious about state transfer in programming. But and this is switched to workflow interface so far. So compared with a normal programming, so the same type of function would be written in the same type of feeling. And if there are some multiple ones, so we need to con we can consider how it goes to after the execution so one programming as well as payment process can be written in a more natural way and develop in a natural way that's one big thing and to be more specific there as for the optimization part of the activities can be simply in non-sync so the workflow can be executed that would also impact many years thank you very much so the last question from me so i guess that the conflict will happen uh, so how do you handle the conflict if i uh, talk about it then i can make a whole session out of it but then so for the conflict before we respond to it, what I always think is that we have to be able to detect it, otherwise we cannot respond to it. So if we don't, um, if you write the program without caring about it, like uh, the state of uh, being processed, being processed has to be stored on a DB, and if that is not implemented in the codes, then you cannot detect an error when it when the error happens. Happens. So uh, we used to uh, trace the uh, state transitions, uh, but then in one process, if it's being processed, then that the process has to be managed one by one, and so that we can detect that the, when the process fails. And the uh, present tracer uh, detects the uh, the integral. Uh, disintegrated or the conflict. So uh, if you can detect it, you can respond to it. And um, one is that if you can rerun it, then you should rerun it. And then if you can't, you have to roll back. So rerun or re execute looks simple, but then like uh, you have to make sure that the uh, Item potency of the uh, the API has to be secured. So, in MailPay, the each service uh, has to provide the um, API with the in item potency secured. So, but uh, then for the external services, then, then we have to uh, rerun uh, based on the current status. But for the rollback, you know if like a DB transaction functionality, if it's, it would be nice if we pretend that it didn't happen, but in reality, the, the in case of a process across the services, especially the um, across the external services, then the, the, the damage data will be reflected upon the history so that you have to, of course, repay to the customer so that they don't uh, they don't lose any uh, profits. But then uh, you have to roll it back. Uh, so, but uh, you know, 
since time is limited, I cannot explain anymore. So, uh, well, thank you. It's time. So we close the QA time. And then uh, please fill out your audience survey. And we are waiting for your feedback. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, hello, um, hello team. So uh, thank you very much for joining this session. So uh, this session uh, is about building an inclusive multicultural environment at Merpe, about the past, the present, and the future. And uh, we have two hosts, uh, both Tim and I, and we will do a short self-introduction. So starting with me, uh, my name is Robert. Uh, my surname is a little bit hard to pronounce, but uh, it's Yeroshek, and I am an engineering manager here at Merpe. Um, I joined around 2018, um, but I have like uh, some history, let's say, in uh, working with in different countries. So before Japan, I used to work in Korea, and before that in Spain. But I come from Slovenia, and I used to work in like a few different industries, and even in Merpe. I actually started as a backend engineer, and then I wanted to change my role to engineering manager, um, like being in charge of a few different teams, and now focusing on uh, managing other managers and trying to build a better organization together. And now we have Tim. Yeah, so my name is Tim Tozi. Maybe easier to pronounce. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, ultimately, um, I've also worked in different countries, uh, France, UK, and now Japan, of course. I'm coming from Paris originally. I worked in a different industry too, and uh, specialized in uh, fintech around like three, four years ago, something like that, I guess. And joined Merpe in uh, 2020, at the very beginning of the year, just before the corona situation. Uh, and at the same time, basically, I arrived in Japan. So I started as a backend engineer in the QIC team, moved to the TL role, and uh, since March 2021, I'm the engineering manager for QIC, but also manage other team where when the needs uh, was existing, uh, such as the CSO team and the balance team. Thank you very much, team. So um, yeah, I will be facilitating the main parts, but uh, it's going to be a panel discussion. So we will be talking, and if you have any questions, uh, please ask at any time. So you can post in our YouTube chat, um, or you can use uh, the Twitter hashtag #MrPayTechFest and ask questions on Twitter as well. So feel free to use Japanese or English when you ask questions. So um, we will answer in English, of course, um, but there is an interpretation uh, in Japanese. Um, but if you are, uh, let's say, uh, up to it, then you can also listen to the English channel itself. Um, so yeah, then uh, let's get started with building an inclusive multicultural environment at Merpe. So first of all, let's start in the past. So uh, I put a few dates here. Um, 
I already mentioned one, but uh, the other two, you will soon uh, see why I put them there. So the first one actually is uh, when I joined Merpay. So yeah, I joined Merpay, as I said, in July of 2018. And uh, I joined as a backend engineer. And uh, so this was before the Merpay launch, right? So Merpay launched in 2019 in February. And as you can imagine, uh, when you're trying to launch a service as big as Merpay, uh, there's a lot of things that have to be done. So it was very, uh, well, chaotic kind of startup-ish, I guess, which is also one of the things that attracted me to come and uh, build Merpay. And uh, we have a few values and I actually put like all for one here um, because it's the value that allowed us to launch Merpay successfully, I believe. So um, at that time, Merpay didn't have as many engineers as we have now. So um, a lot of uh, engineers and not just engineers, like everybody from Mercari, the whole uh, like company, came together to launch Merpay and made it a success. So of course, there were many difficulties in there, but everybody coming together for the success of Merpay was really something that made me proud to be a part of this uh, endeavor. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, after the launch, um, we reached 5 million Merpay users in, well, a few months. So uh, you can imagine that, so yeah, before the launch, it was hectic. After the launch, it was also very hectic. Uh, but still, we are here, we are, uh, well, growing. So uh, yeah, we did a great job at that time. Everybody together, even before team joined us. But nice. anyway, so <laughs> at that time, um, as you can imagine, so um, Merpay is a financial service in Japan. So uh, building this um, requires a lot of um, work as well. But also, if you are in an industry that is uh, a bit more traditional than some other industries, um, then there is a lot of like, of course, legal text, regulations, but also a lot of that is only available in Japanese. And you need Japanese. But when I joined, I actually joined Merpe as the first foreign hire from abroad. So we had a few foreigners inside the company, but they all came from within Japan. So I was the first who joined from abroad. I came directly from Korea to Merpe. And uh, at that time, HR was a bit confused. Uh, but anyway, we kind of uh, made it happen. And uh, still though, um, with Mercari having already more foreigners and already hiring more and more English speakers. Um, there were sometimes a little bit of, uh, let's say, misunderstandings, miscommunications. So a lot of effort was put into how can we collaborate better? So how can we communicate better? Uh, we are still doing this now. So it's not like, okay, it's written like past, but we are still kind of trying and always improving. And, uh, but still at that time, um, yeah, it started, uh, and uh, you can see that uh, I put a few different teams uh, names here. So DNI team, GOT, so global operations team, LDT, language education team. So Mercari put a lot of effort, and still we are putting a lot of effort into supporting not just English speakers, but also Japanese speakers, because we believe that we should be working together. So it's not just, okay, the I don't know the Japanese have to learn English no it's also about the foreigners trying to learn Japanese trying to learn the culture so it kind of goes both ways right and uh, both sides can have their own like um, let's say biases as well so uh, this unconscious bias training was one good thing that uh, our DNI team tried doing okay understanding what biases there may be trying to resolve those and just being aware is already uh, a giant step. Uh, we also have a lot of support from the GOT, so global operations team, all the time. Uh, so yeah, without them, we wouldn't be able to survive, really. <laughs> so uh, they support us during our one-on-ones, during our meetings. So if you need interpretations, they are there. If you need to have something translated, so I have a spec. As I said before, uh, Japan, like, Fintech finance is a very uh, regulations heavy industry right? and uh, there is a lot of Japanese tax. So the first team I joined was the bank team. So we had to work with banks. 
uh, how to connect with banks. And their specs were in Japanese, of course. So GOT was there to help us with translating those specs. But there was also other support. So um, as I said, we need to kind of work together. And how can we work together better? Like trying to kind of do some kind of team building events. So we had chat lunches. So this was before Corona when it was a bit easier. So we had chat lunches in person where you could join a Japanese speaking chat lunch. Um, the company would pay for that. And you could just like talk in Japanese. Uh, the Japanese could join the English speaking chat lunch. Um, not even like the Japanese or the English, but just those that wanted to practice that language. So uh, we have people who are more fluent in Japanese, but are not Japanese. Uh, so yeah, uh, you could join either one and just practice or just uh, get to know others. So we put a lot of effort into this kind of bonding as well. And we also had language learning support. Um, and yeah, I mean, like uh, there's many other things that we're trying to do. And uh, you can check the links for more details. Um, but yeah, um, then, um, well, we did many things and uh, actually I became involved into trying to push for this kind of organizational changes, slowly trying to support other engineers. I saw that many uh, things could be improved. And uh, of course, um, when you're joined as an engineer, your main focus is delivering the product and delivering the service, making sure that it's stable, making sure that it works, it can scale, there's no problems. But then after some point, you're like, okay, what other problems? At least I was thinking like that. What other problems could I help solve or improve? So I saw a lot of um, potential uh, there as well for me. And uh, Mercari has this nice um, system where it's quite, well, it's not like super easy, but like it's still, they uh, want to kind of uh, make you uh, give your best. And for me, uh, I wanted to tackle become an, an engineering manager. And uh, even before becoming an engineering manager, I already like joined some of the meetings, the discussions. So uh, that's one of the also got things like you can join this kind of like improvements, changes, even before you're like a manager, even if you're like just working uh, in the engineering or even on the product or like anywhere else, like we welcome this kind of one of our values is go bold. So if you want to change something, you can do it regardless of your role. And uh, another thing that um, happened uh, a little bit after uh, that I put here as well is uh, collaboration with Mercari. So of course we have been collaborating both Merpay and Mercari. We are in the same app. Um, so you use us in the same place basically. Um, but then like after the initial launch, um, there was a project to try to optimize the home screen a little bit. And that required even stronger collaboration between Merpe engineers and uh, Mercari engineers. Um, so we had this uh, project ongoing and there were a few frictions um, that happened. So um, to clarify how to better collaborate together, um, at that time, um, something was created called uh, the English Communication Guidelines. So we do want to become a global tech company. That's what our aim is. And uh, we don't want to force people to use English only, um, but we do want to kind of set expectations clear. And uh, sometimes we don't set those very clearly because of course, as a startup, uh, we want to just make things work. And, uh, but still sometimes setting expectations uh, or some guidelines can help improve collaboration. And uh, that's uh, what we did for that specific project. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, soon after that, Tim became an engineering manager as well. So he was actually the first non-Japanese speaking engineering manager at Smurpay. So maybe Tim can say a little bit about how his experience was. Yeah, I'm not sure like I should be proud of that, uh, <laughs> but it's true. Um, still, like my, my Japanese level is not so good. Back in the days, um, it was like quite a challenge, you know? Uh, there are like big differences between like JP and, and Meripay ultimately. Um, we all work like for the same group um, instead of the same application, mm. but in terms of like process management, in terms of like organization, even like cultural organization, it's slightly different. And uh, one part of that, uh, of course, is the language which is used. From the very beginning, Meripay like as, as Robert mentioned and as I could understand by myself, uh, used mostly 
or almost exclusively Japanese most of the time, mm. which makes things kind of like a bit difficult for people that doesn't mm. speak uh, Japanese, basically. And of course, when um, these kind of like barriers are created in, your daily, in a daily basis work, mm. uh, it's just like more difficult to contribute. So I discussed it with uh, Robert that was like already trying to change the things um, jointly with David. David, we love you. Uh, and actually, I suggested that maybe I could join uh, to to work on this project. So Robert like welcomed me uh, inside of it. And yeah, basically, I started uh, working this project as TL, moved to a new position slightly later. Uh, and one of the first contributions I made actually to this project was the English inclusiveness evaluation system. So it's a very, very uh, <laughs> long name. <laughs> I call the names I'm giving to my project. but. <laughs> The thing is that before you start uh, actually to try to change anything, you have to understand the situation, right? And you do that like for everything, like even like when it's something technically you're going to change, you're going, you're starting with an investigation if you want to be sure of like the, the risk of merging a feature or creating a feature. If you start with a business, you start with a business plan. Basically, first you analyze the situation and that's what we did. So this evaluation system is basically kind of like a matrix where uh, we try to map all the different aspects of communication for an engineer inside of the company. And uh, we defined in addition of these different categories, uh, different levels of uh, English usage inside of a team. So for instance, in these categories, you have like, what is the language used on Slack? Uh, what is the language used during the meetings? What is the language used within the code base? Uh, like. What about the onboarding? What about the playbook? Uh, but ultimately, all these kind of things. Um, and for each of these different, uh, different like let's say, categories, we have like different levels ranging from none mm. to gold. And mm. the more you re you like goes up in these levels, the closer you have like a totally bil bilingual environment. So, so you were trying to gamify the system a little bit. Say again? You were trying to gamify the system with... Exactly. Like, uh, uh, thing, it's actually an idea from David. So David, mm. I didn't forget. It, it was coming from you. Yeah, I had like an uh, idea for different levels actually already mm. because I didn't want to like to change everything for everyone mm. all at once. Yeah, of course. Uh, it was like more interesting to go gradually. When you introduce mm. such a big change, it's important to take into consideration that people are busy and people are not proficient enough to go directly mm. to the target you define. And, mm. and we really need to understand that in general. Mm. When we change something uh, in, in the organizational process of a company, we need to ensure that we do it gradually, slowly, mm. and that we communicate the goal. Mm. But yeah, that's, uh, that's my style. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, of course, it takes time. And as we said before, like, uh, we don't want to push for like, okay, everybody use English only. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, many people were involved, David among them, and many others as well. So it's not just uh, the foreigners, actually. It's also like the Japanese. So everybody, not, I mean, regardless of the nationality. And uh, we don't want to kind of make differences. Um, but still, uh, understanding each other is very important. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, this was about the English inclusiveness evaluation system. And uh, Tim, what what is this? This looks yeah, really nice. So basically, like first, as mentioned, like we try to map the level of uh, English mm. usage uh, through the not through the company, but at least through like most of the backend engineering teams, uh, mm. because well, I'm coming from backend, so it was oh. it sense for me uh, to to try to create like this matrix according to the backend uh, mm. or division organization. Of course, like we slowly like. Um, applied this this kind of like mapping to other teams outside of backend mm. uh, actually on sre architects and clients mm. uh, where celia uh, did a very 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 good job thank you very much celia if you watch this um and then when we understood the situation it was time for the change mm. so basically how could we uh, start to help different teams to move from the current level they had to the next level but it's mm. for the slide slightly after this one yeah basically again after 
the one after okay let's go to the next one perfect this is our uh, message. and yeah be before basically like i uh, started to discuss about like the next projects we we put in place um one of the most important things for people to understand oh. is that we will not drop the use of japanese inside of the company and mm. it's very important that people understand that because mm. uh, i still have these kind of questions coming from time to time people mm. are really afraid and i understand why because um, in japan you have uh let's say big company uh in the past and very recently that decided to just like drop the usage of japanese directly mm. uh and and switch to english uh, all of a sudden it created kind of like huge backlashes mm. uh, as you can understand um it's not obvious for everyone which is not living inside of japan but actually the mm. usage of english is not that spread yet uh even if like people still uh of course study english at school um well let's say the proficiency might be like not uh let's say enough to ensure you that you can use english everywhere in the country or even in big cities like tokyo so basically yeah uh drop like switching directly to english is not something which is possible it's not something that should be done yeah. and uh, it's very important <laughs> I totally disagree. With the I mean, I came to Japan because I wanted to improve my Japanese. So, I mean, I hope. You know, I mean, I really, we don't plan to drop Japanese otherwise. <laughs> it's it, it kind of a surprise because, like, generally in IT, um, yeah, you, like usage of English is like super widespread, like kind of mm. like everywhere I worked before. So, like, of course, London it makes sense, but Paris too. Um, mm. But yeah, it's true that in Japan, it's, it's not that kind of level. Still. I don't know. I mean, when I was in Korea, like, um, it was kind of, I mean, yeah, everybody was trying to use more English, but uh, still, it was maybe similar to Japan. I mean, I guess it depends on the company. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, I mean, company culture yeah. um, is also very important. Um, how you want like, what kind of culture you want to have inside the company, right? Um, but yeah. Um, and we have uh, the next slide, which has also some interesting uh, numbers. Yeah. So basically, like uh, we we started like this this project, oh. uh, which was called like the Inclusive Team Initiative. So basically, mm. like mapping the different levels, but also like rolling out the change. So in order to do that, uh, purpose was to actually create kind of like an objective for all the teams to reach. Uh, of course, it was not like reaching like the goal level everywhere because it makes no sense. So I tried to move to kind of like an empirical approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the KYC at the very beginning when I joined, um, I still had some big difficulties about the usage of English, but still was more advanced than many, many, many teams inside of the company. Mm -hmm. I took it as, uh, let's say, my my basis, my threshold, mm -hmm. meaning that if I could do it, when I joined this uh, this company, and if it was good enough for me to like basically perform my my duty tasks, or even like suggest uh, new improvements or suggest new project, then if we reach this level for every team inside of the company, then it means it's kind of like good enough. And uh, yeah, that's what I call like the minimum inclusiveness threshold, uh, which uh, spans across like all the different categories uh, inside of this uh, matrix I discussed before, and. Yeah, so we started like very slowly with a very small number of teams uh, back in the days. Uh, basically, I think like we tried to focus on the team that were like the most advanced in the in the English usage because, mm -hmm. well, it was just easier. Ultimately, mm -hmm. it was just easier. And then it was difficult because slowly and slowly we rolled out to more teams, more teams and more teams. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, as I mentioned before, uh, Client engineers that join us to try to move this forwards, like Celia. Uh, even like right now, Mercoin is uh, seriously considering to try to apply this uh, this project to their own engineering division. So it's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, we moved from like this uh, this zero team status to fourteen teams today. Hopefully, having like uh, I think around four new teams at the end of this quarter. Between four, between four and six new teams. Yeah finalized mm -hmm. the threshold so it's pretty good it's pretty good of course like it's not perfect i mean like um as robert mentioned like got on a daily basis they save a life i have my meetings with them uh all the presentation with them uh this actual uh meeting event 
talk is, uh, I guess, translated by GOT right now. <laughs> so thank you very much, guys. Um, yeah, we will never get out uh, of uh, the GOT's help, actually. It's something which is like very, very needed, especially mm. since like, we don't want to replace things, uh, but just like, create an environment where we have mm. Japanese users, Japanese language users, and we have English uh, mm. language users. So trying to mix uh, these kind of things, we need kind of like a bridge. And mm. yes, uh, GOT is definitely like required uh, in, in, in this kind of environment. Mm. I mean, you mentioned like, okay, KYC team, uh, I mean, you, you were part of KYC team and uh, although, I mean, KYC is kind of involved in the whole Mercari, right? It's, it means know your customer, right? So yeah. uh, I guess it makes sense that, okay, if it's available for all of Mercari, that uh, it should be kind of in English. So that's also where we kind of come from. Like some teams, they are a little bit more like focused uh, on like their own specific domain that uh, is not maybe so involved with other teams. But if a team is working with other teams and especially like, okay, KYC, the client teams, um, I don't know, like even the previous session uh, payment platform like Phobos and Godric talked about it a little bit. So those that interact with other teams. Mm -hmm. So of course, like um, there is like the internal communication, but also like if you have to write documentation, if you have to write design docs. So um, in, if you share it to other teams and want to have it reviewed, then uh, I mean, yeah, having it in English makes uh, yeah. the most sense. Yeah. But yeah, maybe, I mean, like uh, you talked also about Mercoin a little bit and I mean, Mercoin is a completely new company and maybe we can also talk a little bit about the future. What uh, other next steps we may have? I love the switch. <laughs> really, <that's funny. laughs> really so, so yeah, um, I think yeah, the next slide, uh, basically like there is kind of like the next step we want to move forward uh, when it comes to like the mm. rollout of this big inclusive teams initiative project. Mm. Um, the first thing is that like we almost exclusively focused on the engineering side of the things. Mm. Because, well, first I wanted to finish things, <laughs> finish what I started, <laughs> but also because we know it from the inside. It's, it's mm. much easier for us being in the engineering division to try to explain how we should like try to move forward uh with with the organization and the language usage inside of the engineering division when it comes to products uh which is like also very 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 close uh to to the engineers of course on a daily basis it, it's much difficult because like we're not working inside of the product we have like some echoes we know from mm -hmm. a distance how it works but we need people from the inside that knows what are like the current challenge for them to move to something which is kind mm -hmm. of like more inclusive in mm -hmm. the language and that's basically what we need uh, to do and what we started to do, mm. uh, especially uh, with two people. So uh, Aya from Mercoin, that uh, actually came, uh, I mean, actually recently started to attend our uh, DNI task force meeting to try to see how she could actually roll this out uh, inside of Mercoin, but also like uh, Shiten, Shiten san from Gross platform team that mm. is also trying to push uh, from inside. I know that mm. you, Robert, like you also have like other people you speak, you're speaking mm. with uh, that is are trying to, uh, yeah, roll out this project uh, from the- so, yeah, Like uh, in our company, I mean, in general, like yeah, there is a lot of this kind of bottom up, like, I mean, it's mentioned here, like bottom up approach. Mm. Yeah. Um, so basically go bold, yeah, means kind of bottom up in a way, because I mean, if you want to make a change, um, we definitely welcome that and uh, i mean okay i started team started i mean you mentioned okay on mercoin there are some people that joined uh, proactively so uh you can just do it and uh, of course like as a next step i guess here it says top-down participation so it doesn't mean that we want to force uh top down right it just means uh kind of okay we started this from bottom up but at some point, it's also good to get like upper management support. Like, of course, they support it, but like more proactively, like, uh, I don't know, using English, being aware of this. And we have had like, uh, I remember very vividly in the past, uh, and we still do like English all hands. Mm -hmm. So um, and upper management, like VP, CTO, CEO, like they use English at those uh, times as well. So we want more of that even. And but we don't want to like only switch 
to English all hands, of course. Yeah. So this kind of mixture, like a little bit of Japanese, a little bit of English, like kind of inclusiveness uh, yeah. and diversity in yeah, in all senses, uh, but not just language inclusiveness uh, in general. So uh, we kind of welcome DNI and we support. It's part of our culture uh, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, product side has also been involved and uh, we have a lot of different plans for the future um, and many people are involved. And actually, like one of the other things um, that we are planning in the future is about, well, it's it's in the present, but also connected to our future, uh, our center of excellence in India. <laughs> yeah, so we announced, uh, I think it was on May, I forgot the date. Um, so we opened, um, this uh, our first, uh, well, we do have Mercari US, but they have like a separate product. So we do kind of, uh, I mean, we talk to each other, but the product itself is kind of separate. So we have Mercari and Merpay and other things uh, in Japan. Uh, but um, this center of excellence in India, we're opening it, of course, to uh, expand, uh, as I said before, to become a global tech company. Um, so this is our first uh, kind of bigger, Go bolt endeavor in that uh, sense, and uh, it will be a new challenge. So if we have all the answers, it wouldn't be a challenge. So uh, we are going to try and make it work in a Mercari like way. So again, we have our own culture, and uh, how this will work out, uh, I'm kind of looking forward to it. And there are of course many challenges. So uh, until now. Um, a lot of the development, uh, basically all of it for the Japanese market happened inside Japan. So both me and Tim and other engineers, they came um, from abroad and they came to Japan uh, to work on the product. They could experience the product. But if you are not in Japan, then um, it's a bit hard to experience the product itself. It's a bit hard to experience the culture. You cannot just go out and see how it is. Uh, you cannot just hear Japanese all the time. Um, so this will be a new challenge and how we can solve it, how we can make it work uh, is going to be very interesting. And we are considering all of this already. So uh, <clears throat> definitely it's going to be uh, interesting to say the least. Um, but yeah, uh, let's see how this works out. And uh, yeah, towards a global tech company. There is uh, a lot of things we still have to do uh and uh but we are on the way and uh we shared a little bit um but yeah that's the end of the presentation i guess uh now um i would like to kind of uh open the floor i mean you could ask the questions even before but uh if you have any questions feel free again to post in our youtube chat or on twitter and uh, we will answer those questions uh, to the best of our ability. But until then, let us have a little bit of a chat. <laughs> so, Tim, uh, what do you think? You're looking at the chat. Um, I wonder. I mean, yeah, like the, the session, like it's pretty good, like compared to what it was before. I, I don't know, like mm. we can really like convey the feelings we had. Uh, at the moment we joined the company and, and explained mm. like, how challenging it was for us as mm. and like how is it sounds right now uh, mm. for, for the members uh, we, we work with it, mm. it's kind of like uh, yeah night and days it's not finished of course like there are like so many things we, we need to do um, and of course like we we specifically like focused on the DNI aspect of the language uh, mm. but when it comes to like multiculturality uh, there are a lot of things uh, we could probably like improve the company, of course. So we, we had even like, uh, I just remembered, sorry to interrupt. Um, there was like a, a project, uh, <clears throat> it was about uh, building the, so communication and language are kind of tied together. So um, we made a project to kind of uh, visualize each other's communication profile. So what this means is different cultures of course, they, in different countries, they have different languages, mm -hmm. um, but they also have different styles of communicating in general. Mm -hmm. So maybe some cultures are a bit more direct. Some cultures are a bit more like, okay, uh, you don't say it directly, you say it indirectly. 
some cultures prefer like just interrupting immediately. Some cultures prefer taking step by step, like, okay, just turn by turn. I talk, you talk. Um, so it really depends on how we can build this culture, uh, like Mercari like culture in this multicultural environment. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely uh, a challenge. We had one question actually uh, that I saw, uh, which was like mm. how the center of excellence is helping uh, Merpay actually. Mm. Um, so basically like we don't want to create like, let's say uh, uh, a, a task center or something like that. It's going to be definitely like a part of Merpay, which is going to be developed and owned uh, mm. by this uh, center of excellence. So mm. um, I know that many tech companies in tech right now create their uh, tech centers in India and they do it mostly because of the cost so mm. i know that for us i don't think that's the main reason um first like we have a lot of uh, indian citizens working inside of the group and when i say a lot i mean it so it just made sense uh, trying to create like let's say an external center outside of japan where in mm. japan it's kind of, like difficult as you can imagine to uh recruit the higher the numbers of people we want to hire for the needs we have uh, in terms of development. So definitely like we needed to create something outside. Uh, mm, true, and, true. I mean, yeah, uh, close. <laughs> very close. <laughs> yeah, time zone, of course, like, I mean, I come from Europe, team come from Europe. Uh, I mean, we would prefer maybe if there was one in Europe, you know, you never know. But anyway, like time zone difference uh, is much uh, easier to work with yeah. with India. Uh, and uh, as Tim said, uh, we have a lot of people who joined us from India. And uh, actually, like one of the reasons, I guess, why uh, India was also chosen is because we have people inside the company who pushed for this. So they wanted to build that. They wanted to be part of it. It's not because, um, OK, um, you do it kind of style. No, no, because they wanted to build that. So. Um, they got support and uh, now we are making this happen and uh, yeah it's not just like okay we want to kind of offshore development no it's not like that so we are currently working and planning okay how can we have the teams own certain features certain domains in India but again this requires time and uh, I mean it's part of the trip um, but still uh, definitely uh, look. Mm. any other questions I wonder <laughs> Let me check. I don't see any other questions. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, talking about India. So actually, I really like, so our office is in uh, Roppongi Hills, and I really like this Indian restaurant in Roppongi Hills. <laughs> 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 Anyway, I haven't been to uh, the Indian office yet, but I definitely want to go. Yeah, uh, multicultural. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, for me, um, I remember. I mean, now with Corona, it's a little bit hard to kind of also meet people. Um, so some people they just joined during Corona, and for them, like getting to know others. How can you get to know another if you cannot see them face to face? If you just see the camera, right? So that's also another challenge that we are facing. Uh, I mean, everybody is facing it. So uh, we have been trying uh, various things to improve this. Um, and uh, hopefully um, it's gonna be even better in the future. But um, yeah, um, it takes time and effort and, uh, but still, um, yeah, Mercari supports it and uh, we are here to make that happen. Um, there is a last question. I think like we have two minutes to answer it. So let's be very mm. quick. Okay. Um, so the question is like, someone is very keen to work in Japan uh, in mm. two years, and um, mm. the person wants to know what are the challenges we face uh, working in foreign environments. So mm. the thing is like depends from what is the foreign environment. Like UK was a foreign environment for me. Mm. You know, Japan is another one. It's different. Same for Robert. Uh, like uh, South Korea. South Korea was a foreign environment. Japan is, not, is another one. Actually, I think like adapting to the culture is going to be something which is kind of like difficult, especially if mm. you come from like a culture which is like very different. For instance, Robert and I, we come from Europe, and in Europe, uh, we kind of like very direct, and and in Japan, um, it can be seen as rude. Mm. So we have to adapt how to talk and speak with people. It's part of like uh, some kind of the trainings that Robert presented at the very mm. beginning of the session. That's one of the things. 
Second thing is that like, and it's more for me, I guess, because Robert, like you can read English, uh, read Japanese and uh, no, cannot read Japanese. <laughs> but if you don't speak the language in the country, and if you don't, you cannot read the language of the country, it's going to be incredibly difficult for you to live here. And you have to consider mm. that there is isolation, right? You are like at the opposite side of the world, I mean, in my uh, in my case. But mm. also like, it's difficult to bond with people because you don't speak the language and difficult to basically understand what is happening around you so that's something you need to consider yeah definitely um i mean there are many challenges but um if you are very interested in working in japan um i would say sorry go for no no i mean go go for it like really go for um, it Worth so it. yeah basically um it will be an experience for you and mm. uh japan is also trying to uh as a like a country to also uh, have more English in general and uh, to support. I mean, there are a lot of foreigners in Tokyo, especially. Mm. So um, yeah, it is challenging, but uh, if you wanna uh, live here or if you wanna just try, I definitely would recommend you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, I think we are already out of time. So uh, thank you very much for uh, joining today's session and uh, hope uh, you learned something from it. So that's it. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Hello everyone. So all of today's session have concluded. Thank you for watching. So hello again. So my name is Sensui, aka 1000J, VP uh, of Engineering at Melpay. So now I'd like to move on to the closing. So how did you feel about Melpay Tech Fest 2022? So fundamental technology organization was a the theme for today. So client and backend, what are they doing as well as the choices? So what about as well as the work style of mail carry? I made a presentation on the first day, so their keynote presentation as well as credit uh, stories as well as engineering stories. So there is an overall technical issues and all three days there are many topics covered. And I think you have enhanced understanding what we are doing as engineers. I hope, and also ourselves. We also had an, it was an also good opportunity for us to look back what I have done. So that will be a nice opportunity to go forward. So it's not only for MailPay, but FinTech, as well as Marketplace, we'd like to merge all of those areas. So as America group, we'd like to provide further values. And also we'd like to support this as engineers. As a, for the group. So we really appreciate your support. And uh, the request to you, so please take a moment to respond to our viewer survey. So the link is in the YouTube description uh, summary section. And also, Merpay is looking for software engineers. So if you're interested in joining us after listening to today's session, please come to the speaker or you can please check the recruitment section of Merpay's corporate website. And also, I would, I would also appreciate if you could register your program and give it a high rating. Thank you for your participation over three days. We hope to have to see you next year again. So if it is held, please, we are waiting for you to see you. And thank you very much indeed for the cooperation about the management and preparation of the session. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. <laughs>